Ayo Paiowati, who flew F-105s and a whole bunch of other stuff. He's got a storied career, and uh, that's partly why we're starting early, so we've got enough time. So without further ado, because you don't want to hear me talking, uh, let me inter introduce Pio. Hello, sir. How are you? <laughs> good evening. Doing well, Bover. Doing well. Yeah, it's good to... It's good to have you here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate the actual, I, I was introduced via the River Rats. So I know that's a, a really good organization and uh, maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, coming on the channel. Where are you now, by the way? You're down in Florida? Yeah, I'm in Florida, Cape Canaveral. So we nice, get to watch, nice. the, watch all the space launches here. And you've got a really cool bar behind you, which I yeah. think is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I wonder, let me let me swing the screen around a little bit here, and there's a oh, there's a thud there from that uh, outfit in China makes them out of steel. They sent that to me. That's off a strike that I flew, and uh, they used my name and the model, uh, the tail number. Somebody said, "Hey, they ever ask you about that?" So I wrote them. I said, "You know, you could have asked me before you gave the little blurb." They sent me a free <laughs> model, about a four hundred dollar nice. model. Yeah, over here's uh, pictures from. Um, these are done by Lou Drendel. That's his cover art for his book on the 105. So got a lot of good stuff here hanging. It was my wife's idea to have a bar rather than a oh, living room. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a, a, that's a good wife. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, so let's get right into it. Pio, how'd you get into flying, man? You've been flying for a long time. Well, what got yeah. you into... Hold on just one here. I've got to, uh, because we've got the bar... Uh, oh, of course. Yes. Little, let's let's little IPA. Um, I, I started out enlisted as a survival instructor, joined the Air Force because I didn't have anything else to do, quit college because I was bored. And um, after eight years with five years in grade for staff sergeant for E5, uh, I decided I was in the wrong racket. So I went to your OCS and uh, I was getting my pre-commissioning physical and a young GI said uh, with an eye test, do you want to be a pilot or a navigator? I said, I'm too old for either one. I, he said, oh, put in for an age waiver. Oh, okay. So put me down for pilot. That's how it happened, just like that. If that E3 had that's not awesome. asked me, do you want to be a pilot or a navigator? I, I don't know what I would have done. So that's how it started. By the way, wow. cheers. Wow. Yeah, cheers to you as well. Thank you for uh, <laughs> well, sharing so you, your bar with it. All right. <laughs> oh, and, man, uh, we should have got the Jeremiah weed out. But Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have any Jeremiah, but uh, I'm going to get it. We're going to get a, uh, another Veterans Day gathering here for the people in the condo, and I'm going to introduce them to uh, the Jeremiah Weed and have the little shot glasses out for everybody. Yeah, you better stock up. They're, they're, they they stop making it again. Oh no! Oh gosh! Yeah, oh, well. yeah, okay. yeah. I, I read that the other day. I was like, God, I don't know what we're going to do. No. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> well, all right. So you, uh, you, you. Basically, did you have any flying experience before that? I mean, had you flown as a kid? Did your parents growing up or anything? Uh, my dad, after World War II, learned to fly in the GI Bill, wanted to be a pilot, and uh, got all the way up to his multi and instrument. But uh, there were hundreds of thousand pilots available in you know, 1945, 48. And by 49, he, he gave up the idea. But I rode with him a couple of times. Um, but uh, no stick time with him. A captain, when I was enlisted in Japan, gave me 30 minutes of stick time in a C-54 rescue squadron. And um, I guess you can't say this now, but he said, you fly like a Chinese, one wing low. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 hurt, that hurt my heart. <laughs> but that was the... Uh, that's awesome. That was, I'm sorry, that's not PC. I hope that our... No, our, we don't do that here. You know, no, that's no, we not... Can't. We're not PC here. So continue. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got so I got into pilot training, did well there. Um, only through others' attrition, I ended up class leader and number three in my class. I could show you, if, but I don't want to move the camera around. But uh, I've got my daughter's plaque for distinguished graduate in her pilot training class. I was oh, number cool. three; she was number two, and uh, she's now a uh, aircraft commander in air rescue C one thirty. So, Daddy's really proud of her. Uh -huh. Oh, that is awesome. Good for her. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations to you and, yeah. and, and your daughter. That That's awesome. Well, um, so what were you flying in pilot training? What year is this? What, uh, that what was 62, you? 63. Uh, T-37, of course, had come in uh, in 59. Uh, the T-38 was just coming into Willie at that time. In fact, we used then, you know, we didn't uh, use the tenths of hours. We used in increments of five minutes. And I got in a T-38 that had 35 minutes on it. 
from Palmdale supersonic to Willie. Wow. And 35 minutes on it. With brand, you know, the leather stick boots. You know, you, you fly the AT-38. I flew it also. But that yep. being one that was brand new. And solo, we could go to 45,000 feet squawking uh, VFR. And um, it was just, it was <laughs> wonderful. Awesome. No transponder in the T-37, so you could get away with a lot, even as a student. So it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, how'd you, I mean, so... How'd you like the transition to flying, you know, military aircraft? Was it tough? Did you get sick? Did you have any issues? Or was it just, I'm, I'm at home now? I, I really worked hard at it. And I had no idea that I was doing well. On my first check ride, I got a 51 score. Well, 65 is a D, you know, and 64 yeah. is, a, is an F. <laughs> I did not know I was flying on an absolute scale against, you know, Rick Dauphin or Eric Hartman or Douglas Botter at 51 score. Uh, turned out it was the highest score in my class at that time. Nice. Anyway, um, so I, I really struggled trying to do well. My instructor, who later died in F5, was really tragic. But I remember one day he said, can't you please do just a little better for me? You know, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to cry. I tried so hard. But anyway, it, it all came It all came. Uh, came through by the end, and uh, I did quite well, I think. so. And, and it became fun, you know. Really yeah, uh, you're, it's always fun when you're doing well. So track select, <laughs> what was what was number one, and and what did you end up? Uh, I mean, you're you're talking. I mean, Viet Vietnam is is in the back of your mind at this point, or kind it of what's was. going on at this time? It was, and uh, in fact, I had volunteered out of OCS for Jungle Gym, which you know, may have had me flying or not, but I didn't get picked up for it. Uh, that was the early on T twenty eights, the O ones. Sky Raiders and mm -hmm. so forth, um, wow. and CIA type flying. But um, when it, our class at graduation, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, number one and two got a uh, F-100, and number two got the backseat. Sorry, I got that. Yeah, I don't remember now. One and two got, anyway, backseat of an F-4 and, uh, and a Hun. So uh, I got a tweet as an instructor. So I became a FAPE, first uh, assignment instructor okay, pilot. Yeah. And I really enjoyed instructing. I wanted to be like my instructor, Tom Walsh had been, who was so easygoing, demanding, but always polite and pleasant, never cursed, never raised his voice. And uh, I flew with some screamers too, but I wanted to be like him. And I think I did a good job instructing and really enjoyed it. Uh, was, went to Laughlin Air Force Base. Uh, it was a good place for pilot training. Got a little bit of weather, a little bit of wind, not as much wind as uh, Vance, not as much weather as uh, as uh, Craig and Moody at that time. And mm -hmm. uh, went uh, up to officer training after about a year on the flight line, continued to fly the tweet, and then went out to the T-41 in after about two and a half years. That was a Cessna contract program with Cessna 172 with civilian contractors. The manager was a retired lieutenant colonel from Laughlin, and one of his uh, uh, managers below him was my former squadron commander in T-37s. We had one guy there with 14,000 IP hours, direct oh. commission in World War II as an IP. And I had Jeez. to give these guys check rides. So that was, <laughs> they were, oh they were kind. Oh, my God. Because I'd never, I'd never turned a prop at that time. Never, ever. So here I am with 30 hours in a, in a Cessna 172 giving check rides to guys with you know, P fifty seven, P fifty one pilot, P forty seven pilot, P forty pilot, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they were they were kind to me. They understood the job. And then I got well, my orders to thuds. Well, you, you talk about the differences back then. I mean, you're in a tweet. You could they would grab your oxygen mask, right? I mean, it oh, was oh you... yeah. Uh, I I flew with a flight commander one time, Joe Selleck. I hope he's still around. And can hear this. I really like that guy actually, <laughs> but he would say, "I got it." And he'd whip the airplane around back and forth, up and down, put some negative Gs on it and pull back hard and not make you pass out or blackout, but actually pass out. And then he would be giggling when you finally come to with no awareness, <laughs> no awareness at all of where you are. I gotta yeah. give, I'll give you one. Flight Commander T-38, Dick Hickenbottom. And if he hears this, he's heard this story, so it'll be all right. He was a, he was a screamer and a monster. I saw him later at uh, years later. And I said, why did you always fly with me and scart vet and uh and parker he said you were the only guys that weren't afraid of me i said my god we were scared to death well anyway a cross-country flight we go to <clears throat> from willie up to hamilton my mother lived across the bay i visit with her we go to bars in berkeley and uh, with my couple of buddies next day over at hamilton's and we're leaving 
And I do all the flight planning. Everybody else is, you know, hungover as people were then. Flight commander yeah. pays no attention at all. We take off, do the Oakland one departure, whatever. And it's a, it's a figure eight climbing to get up above the traffic before you leave uh, over Oakland. And I pull out a burner at, uh, you know, gear up, flaps up and uh, pull out a burner. Says, what are you doing? We want to do what those other guys did. Unrestricted climb to 45. I said, well, sure, you didn't tell me. And so, okay, we fly the, the departure. We're heading south, heading down toward the Santa Barbara uh, Tacan. And I'm at 43, 45, whatever it was, hemispheric then. And it's beautiful, wow. dark blue sky, curve of the ocean out to the right. The pedal boom is doing this little tiny Dutch roll about, oh, three inches, figure eight, back and forth. That candy stripe out there. He says, what's the cabin altimeter? I said, 17, sir. I'm going off intercom. He lights up a Paul Mall. I smoked then. Oh, <laughs> I, anything if I could have smoked, but I didn't. Air, pretty soon the airplane settles down. You know, 38 <laughs> at that altitude, you can feel any movement. And oh, yeah. it's smooth as can be. And pretty soon California moves away from us as we're heading out toward the, you know, the tack end down below. The airplane comes alive. It moves. The mic comes alive. Yeah, here's the words. Where in the hell are we? I said, sir, we're about 50 miles out of uh, Santa Barbara. But I should have said, I, I don't know, <laughs> but I did. He said, <laughs> what in the hell is that? I said, "That what, sir? All that, bad words, water. I said, sir, it's a Pacific Ocean. He says, the what? Of course, he's looking out to the right mover, and there's nothing, <laughs> nothing all the way to Hawaii. Of course, land is straight down on the left. <laughs> where in the where in the blankety blank blankest land? I says just outside on the left, sir. <laughs> and uh, he was mortified, and I reminded him of that ten years later. But anyway, he was a screamer, and uh, but I I didn't want to be like him. And anyway, so I had a good time instructing. I really really enjoyed it, and I still hear from students, you know, across country and uh, not across country, but at reunion or something or on internet, somebody will catch me and find me. Well, get on to the thud <clears throat> after get, I get dry. You know, it's, it's all. It's, oh, it, it happens. Yeah. No, please. And it also yeah. loosens the vocal cords so that That's you can right. Just, tell better therapeutic. stories. Therapeutic. Anyway, I'm sitting out at the T-41, the tiniest, slowest aircraft in the Air Force inventory, single engine. And I'm going to the biggest, 25 times more it weighed and flew five times faster. Its landing speed was 20 knots over the VNE of a test Cessna 172. And they're gonna put me in the single engine, single seat airplane and send me to Hanoi where there's more guns than there were around Berlin in 43, 44. Oh. And to add to this, the first 11 men to have left Laughlin to go to Southeast Asia, all of them in props, O1s, A1s, um, Goonie Birds, C-123s, all were dead. Not a single man had finished his, under, his tour over there. And I'm going wow. to Hanoi. Well, I got up to McConnell, and I had a great time. All the instructors there were wearing their 100-mission patch. That one right there. And that, I was in awe of those guys. And it was a heck of a lot of fun, the training. It was not very appropriate to the work we we're going to do, die bombing, because their mission, their primary mission was still nuke delivery. So we did a lot of simulated nuke deliveries. Uh, but anyway, oh, and one air-to-air -air mission. And we started out at 20,000 feet, opposite sides on a circle. 180 degrees later, we hit 10,000 feet, knock it off. That was it. So, <laughs> it's like A-10 going, BFM. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I'm going up a few months later. I'm going to go see what a MiG-17 can do, you know, or 21. Oh, wow. So <clears throat> I get over to Talk Lee. And I had a very good time there. I enjoyed Thailand very much. Uh, the first wing commander was a, a bit of a prig. I won't even talk about him. But the second one, John Gerardo, was a prisoner of war in Germany and a prisoner of war in Korea. If you read the book by uh, about, pardon me, Yuri Gagarin, he talks about John Glenn flying overhead John Gerardo, who was shot down on his 99th mission over Korea. And Glenn staying down until he stayed so long, he had a dead stick back home. Uh, pretty nice for a Marine wow. pilot to do to, for an Air Force guy. Anyway, John Gerardo became my second wing commander there. And what an awesome guy he was. Uh, had a couple of memorable, well, they were all 
all memorable, but got 102 over the North. So some of them don't stand out that much anymore. But I remember all the targets. The first one I thought was a real hoot, a little more here of the IPA. Um, I go up with the uh, vice wing commander, Jack Broughton of uh, Thud Ridge fame. And uh, he wisely put me out in front so I could see my way around in Route Pack 1, the lower part of North Vietnam. We meet up with the FAC, and the FAC sees me as number one. So he says, okay, lead, I've got this cluster of huts down here uh, just about two miles from where I'm orbiting. Roger, got them, tally-ho, or click, click. He says, okay, get those. Now, in training, we carried six bombs in a, in a rack on the belly, a Sioux a dispenser, and we dropped them singly, one at a time. Hit the pickle button and one bomb, up and around again, back down with another bomb, and do that six times, and shoot the gun and come home. So I roll in on these, on these uh, huts, and I hit the pickle button and pull off. Oh, crap, I got six bombs. I hit it again. Meanwhile, the fact is... <laughs> The fact now is told number two. So, okay, two on the other side of that ridge where Lead's bombing, there's a cars and some, oh, hey, two, or Lead, only two of your bombs came off. Okay, now those those uh, caves over there, oh, uh, here come the rest of your bombs. All right, now two of those caves, never mind, Lead got them also. So I got <laughs> I got two targets on one pass on my first mission. So, nice. So that nice. Kind of, that's, that's good luck. A couple yeah. other missions. <clears throat> One of them was quite moving. Um, I became a, a flight lead pretty early on. I think they, they treated me well for being a, a puke out of training command. But uh, I, I checked out as a four-ship lead, and we're going to the Yen Bai Airfield, which is 40 miles northwest of Hanoi on the Red River. Um, I had a lieutenant colonel leading. I don't remember now who it was. But we got to a distinctive Omega Bend on the Red River where we turned usually to go to Thud Ridge and the targets over to the east, north of Hanoi. This time we're turning to the northwest. 85 millimeter cannon there fired at us every time, every six or seven seconds, big black bursts, always up above us. I don't know, the gunners, it was like the gunners in uh, <clears throat> in uh, Catch-22. If, you know, if, as long as they don't hit us, we won't bomb them. So anyway, <laughs> the, the guy, he never tracked us. He never followed us, just straight up. Well, they're bursting above us, so big sky, no problem. We circle around the guns, and we head toward the the, uh, the uh, runway up, oh, from there, maybe 20 miles up uh, northwest. I'm in the back of a flight of, with a flight of four, flights of four, all in trail. Uh, the weasels were off to the right of us, off trying to stir up Sam's all on their own, just to, just to do it, because that's what they did. We got about five miles from the runway, and down below at 11 o'clock was a six-gun, 37 millimeter sight firing at the guys up ahead of me. I said to three, go to the runway. I got these guns. I rolled over the top of two and started down. We were up pretty high. Usually we're about 12 to 14,000 feet. Um, stay where we still had good maneuvering speed, doing 440 indicated, 540 true, nine, nice. nine miles a minute over the ground. <clears throat> and uh, I rolled in. I've got a long ways to go down. It took, it takes six or seven seconds to roll over and come back down again. That's a long time. When they start shooting at you, which they did, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Anyway, I get in my dive bomb run. I have to aim short first because I'm pretty high and it keep, keeps moving up. I keep uh, diving over. And immediately all six guns train on me. Now, they were ringing six guns round and round in a circle to protect their eardrums against multiple muzzle bursts at one time could blow their eardrums. Pretty soon they're sparkling. They're just firing as fast as they can. And so the nominal 80 rounds a minute, probably 120 rounds a minute per gun, that's 12 wow. a second are passing my airplane. And I could feel shock waves slam in my belly. I thought it was being hit. I can see heat streaks going past my canopy above, below, and but within several feet on either side. And I'm going straight down, which was probably the thing that saved me because we're just going yeah. like that. Anyway, I get to my release parameters. I pickled. I pulled. Immediately, I turned over, and they're still shooting at me. They had transitioned all the way across, following me. I rolled back over the other way, and the entire bomb site or gun site blew up. Nice. Well, 10 years ago, I went on Google Earth, and I looked up a spot four miles back on the track, and I came upon a picture. Now, this won't show well enough here, but in this picture – that I found four miles away, there is a circular pond right here. And around it, 
or you can't see it on there. It's, it's too small, but there are six equidistant, equally distant spaced scars on the ground where those men and I dueled it out. And let wow. me tell you, Mover, that was one of the most moving, terrible experiences to see that. Uh, yeah. But anyway, to carry that further, years later, I was teaching in the Philippines at International School in Baguio. And a lot of your listeners will know uh, where Baguio is up in the mountains. And uh, I was teaching 12th grade literature. First day there, in fact, I moved. I came in later in the uh, in the uh, semester. I had these 12th grade students. We're doing all quiet on the Western Front. And one said, oh, Mr. Piawati, were, were you ever in the Army? Are we ever in the Army? I said, no, I was in the Air Force. Were you ever in a war? Yeah. Did you ever kill anybody? I said, no, my, my targets were railroads and runways and bridges. But I know some people died, but it wasn't my intent to. Oh, yeah, one day I did. I killed a lot of people. Well, what do you think about that? I'll tell you tomorrow. So the next day, I told them about the mission as best they could understand. And to really put across how I felt about it then and now, I wrote this poem. I turned the, I turned the world upside down on my windscreen and put in the sky on my tail, flew into a stream of shock waves left by projectiles the size of little four ounce baby bottles. But these were two pounds of scrap iron and tritonol fill that had passed a second earlier to explode where I had just been. 50, 60, more and more, and I raced to meet. The red dot of my gun sight crept up toward the bunkered guns. Six red eyes blinking round and round in a circle, disciplined gunners protecting their eardrums. I paused. I stopped. Hung there for a moment for the rest of my life. Couldn't we throw darts instead of steel shrouded explosives? Maybe drink a beer. Throw darts or flip a coin to see who wins. But could they not answer any more than I could ask? And then I was still going a thousand miles an hour. I was ready for the guns and the gunners. Were they ready for me and my bombs? Six guns, six bombs. One pilot against a site commander. Two aimers each. Two loaders each. Three porters for each gun. One to 43. 43 to one. And now... Which team was the luckier, the better? I? They don't have to remember the score now, do they? So I asked my students, I said, what's wrong with war? They said, young people wow. are sent off to be killed. I put that on the blackboard. Young people are sent off to be killed. Number two in front of it. And then I wrote above that, young people are sent off to kill other young people. Put a number one in front of that. I said, and don't ever let your government send you off to kill other young people unless they do it with a will to win and give you the 100% backing you need. If that's the case, you won't have to remember the score. So that's, wow. that'll tell you a little bit about what I think about Johnson and McNamara's war. Wow. But, <clears throat> wow, that's incredible. But we did what we were paid to do, and we did it well. And we actually had a very good time doing it. Uh, once in a while, not at once in a while, about every other day, a beautiful Republic. 50,000 pound Mach 2 airplane would turn into just a big gray cloud and uh, you'd hear a beeper and your friend was either one of the 36 point or 35.9 percent killed or captured or one of the 16 percent that were rescued. We lost 51.2 percent of every D and F model made and that was that was before you count the 91 that were lost before 1965. So the total loss of the available airplanes was probably 61, 62%. And, and with that, when a pilot each time, a pilot or a F model a weasel with two guys. But uh, we went on, did what we were paid to do. The mission of greatest note probably for the wing at that time came on the 11th of August of 67. We were planning the afternoon go probably about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And there were a dozen of us, a couple guys from each flight, doing the flight planning. And the staff sergeant came out, and where the number one target was, he drew a yellow line through it. And above that wrote, one, two, colon, zero, zero. We looked at each other. Ooh, that colon means it's a JCS target. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had listed out nearly 100 targets in 1965, which, if we would have hit in 65, we would have ended the war in 65. And then he wrote, Paul Doomer, Railroad and Highway Bridge. Oh, crap. That's a big bridge. Goes right into Hanoi. And it was the biggest bridge in North Vietnam. About a mile long. Um, three travel lanes, one railroad lane. 
And uh, <clears throat> we uh, planned that. We just changed everything around and did our planning and finished up with an hour left before briefing time. Well, in the one hour of slip between the normal uh, scheduled takeoff time and the adjusted one, the guys on the flight line had to reconfigure 25 airplanes. They had to download the six 750-pound bombs that were on the MER or multiple ejector rack on the belly. Normally, you take bombs off one at a time, very carefully, put them on a rack, one another and another. No, they didn't have time for that. They dropped all six bombs and the rack at one time with oh, a wow. bunch of guys sitting on the back of the MJ-1 jammer so it wouldn't tip on its nose and just put them down on the ramp wherever they could. I mean, there were bomb yeah. racks everywhere, 25 of them. Then they had the down move this 450 gallon wing tanks. Now these wing tanks are very delicate. You know, they're just thin mm -hmm. skin, but they normally have to be defueled before you download them. No, they downloaded them and the pylon in which they sat and put them down gently wherever they could find a place, upload new pylons, do a circuit check and load up two, 3000 pound bombs, one in the wing of each one, each wing of each aircraft. Yes put a 650-gallon tank on the belly, 600-gallon tank, and fuel it, and did this all within a one-hour slip. And uh, 25 airplanes taxied on time. Three ground spares stayed on the ground, were not called. Two airborne spares weren't needed. They went to their alternate target. And 20 airplanes went to the bridge, and the bridge went down. I was number wow. four in the first flight bombing, and uh, Colonel Nelson McDonald, his... his uh, thing of note was he was the first and probably the only ground level ejection in F-84 to survive. And Jeez, that was a, what that happened? Was a loop long, long ago, but, oh. but, uh, but made it. God. So I roll in with the two, 3,000 pounders. We had a six knot wind. That gave me a 60 foot offset. Now, you know, you've dropped iron bombs. It's very hard to offset for a wind. You got that mile long bridge right in front of you. And you got to aim 60 feet off in the mud. Well, I did. Pickled off. Supposed to climb and turn to the left, go down the river, and then turn out to a, a different refueling, post-strike refueling. I didn't. I dropped my bombs. I went out straight ahead over Hanoi because in my, my strike picture that I had, there's the bridge there. I had oh, marked okay. on this. This is the photo that I carried with me. And I had two little round circles where the POW camps were known to be. And I flew down low over Hanoi at about 670 knots indicated saying, Hey guys, somebody here cares. Listen up. And then headed down the river. Well, as I head down the river and I see Colonel Mack, he's a couple miles ahead now. I'm doing again, 650, 670, whatever. And here comes Bougelet bottles going by on the right. About, yeah, they're about that size. Yeah, there you are. They're going by, you know, oh. one after another. So I jink up and left and come back down and damn, here's another one coming by and another 85 millimeter. That's about, yeah, that's about the size right there, isn't it? Jeez. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> they're coming by and I jink up and wait. And I come back and I think, you guys can't hit me. I'm too far away. I'm too fast. It's narrow end on. I'm invisible, invincible. I drink one more time and back down and hell, they're still there. Well, Colonel Max up ahead about a mile now. And he's starting to go into a right turn to head for the tanker. So I lay my airplane on the side, and ah, uh, it's not on the side. It's like on its tail. I get hit in the tail, and I am looking at rice patties. She bounced around. Lights came on. She finally settled down a bit, and the radio call started. And they're really funny. It's two, you're hit. I'm four, by the way. Two, you're hit. Three, you're hit. God, two's hit, three's hit, I'm four and I'm hit, the day's going all to hell. Well, it turned out, as I'm coming in, Colonel Mack thinks I'm three. I thinks I'm, he thinks I'm three. And how did this go? Anyway, two moved over, that's it, two moved over, and Colonel Mack saw me come in and thought that I was still Mack, uh, or Colonel, uh, uh, I was Mal, and he says, two, you're hit. Mal's over here in the other wing now. He's moved over and he sees me and thinks I'm three and says he three's hit. Anyway, <laughs> it was a real mess. Three had gone off to the wrong tanker, so we didn't see him <laughs> at all. Anyway, it settles down. Standard. And, yeah. It was two year hit, three year hit, four year hit. And then finally Malcolm says, uh, this is two, I'm not hit, but four, you're on hit and you're torching a mile. And um, I figured what happened. I got hit in the tail, it blew the afterburner out.
And but yet the fuel is still streaming out and it's flaming, just a raw red, yeah. red flame behind. Probably was not a mile, but probably several hundred feet anyway. So I pulled the throttle back in, which cuts off the fuel, pardon me, the afterburner, turned off the air turbine motor, which gave you, pardon me, again, utility hydraulic pressure back to everything around the tail, and it settled down. So Malcolm says, uh, stick with it, too. The fire's going out. You know, you want to say something cool, Mover, you know, like, tell Lori I love her, or tell him to win one for the Gipper, <laughs> you know. But uh, mm -hmm. what, I said, what I said was, no sweat, it's the best damned airplane in the world. And I met him then, oh, and, and I mean it now. Uh, that and is awesome. If that's a tribute to a piece of Republic iron, well, it deserves it. So I get back to Udorn, Colonel Mack on my wing. Udorn's in northern Thailand, so it saved me several hundred miles going home. And uh, I lowered the gear with, uh, with emergency air pressure and uh, lowered the flaps. They're on DC power. But I'd lost my AC power when I turned off that air turbine motor, so I had no, no basic instruments. I had a little peanut gauge for airspeed and for altitude like that, that's all. And somebody had said, don't trust that little thing, it's worth plus or minus 30 knots. So I got down to 205, I looked at that and I thought, plus or minus 30, man, if it's 30, if it's 30 fast, I'm too slow. Uh, hey boss, how's my speed? Doing fine, John, stick with it, stick with it. So I did, put it down on the first brick and she plunked down hard, no flare. Usually you can flare a thud and hold it off like a, like a 172. And she just hit hard. And I reach up to pull the drag chute, and nothing happened. You uh -oh. know, the Carmen, the Carmen H-43, the dual-bladed uh, helicopter with a fire bottle on it, and the rest of the uh, fire guys starts hollering, no shoot, no shoot, no shoot. All I can say is, no shit, is <laughs> it nothing happened. The whole, <laughs> the whole parachute pack just fell out of the rack and landed on the runway. The, the riser had been cut. So Oh, no. Uh, so I slide my pull the emergency brake handle, slide my feet up on the rudder pedals, and I didn't intend to hit the brakes, but either a hard landing, too fast, or I did touch the brake, the right wheel blew, and uh, they're screaming down the runway, starting to drift off to the right, put the hook down for the midfield barrier, and the right gear door that's hooked up to the gear itself, it geared ground down enough that the door caught the cable at midfield and stopped that airplane uh, with about oh. two inches with a two inch cut in the door. I mean, Republic makes a tough airplane. And here's God. what it, here's what it looked like when I got out. Wow, move it over to your right. Keep it going to your right. There you go, yeah, wow. Yeah. That's now, crazy. I wish I could show you just Joe Cool. They gave me a, a ice cold rag, you see there in my hands. And you see what's down here around my knee? That's my knee board down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's, what's the I rag in your G suit pocket? What's yeah. the white? <laughs> and also, it doesn't show, but when I got out, it was gone by then. But when I got down the ladder, somebody pointed. I had a seat pin in my pocket that I hadn't safety the seat with. So uh, it's bad on me, bad on me. But uh, anyway, uh, they took that tail off that D model and they took a, had a tail from a destroyed F model and put it back on and the airplane flew again. So uh, that was, it was a great mission. And I got back to Talk Lee that night on a Goonie Bird, got into the club, and Mo Baker and Tom Kirk, both of whom became POWs later, the Mo was best buddy over there, congratulated me for getting the span down. And we destroyed one span and damaged two. But Colonel Gerard of the Wing Commander said, we are not, and this was a wise thing to say, we're not going to credit one person, one pilot, with a destruction or damage to a span. And we're not going to criticize those that didn't, that may have missed. We're dropping iron bombs from a mile in the air, World War II bombs. And he said, this was done by all the air crew and especially by all the maintenance guys that got those airplanes in the air with a one hour slip. And he was absolutely right. So that uh, it was good for him to, to have done that and said yeah. that. Yeah. What kind of deliveries? I mean, so I'm, I'm getting more technical as a, as yeah. a mm -hmm. fellow fighter pilot that is fascinated by this. So you're doing diving deliveries with like 45 high 45, angle or- uh, Yeah, 45 degrees. And uh, originally we were dropping 45 degrees. Some guys like 450 knots, some 500. And 100 or 103 mils, each guy, you know, had his own parameters that you develop. And, uh, of course, you had to be able to look over and see what you did, which meant a pretty yeah. quick pretty quick move. Or uh, sometimes a tail camera uh, that we had later on would show where oh, you hit. Oh, yeah. Uh, or other guys behind you could tell you how you'd done. So my bombing got pretty good, I'm, I'm sure, toward the end. 
But it was uh, later somebody said, because it was hard to establish, if you put the speed brakes out, you went too slow. If left it in burner, you went too fast. And somebody experimented. I think it might have been Rick Conkey. He was a captain weapons guy. But somebody experimented. Says, hey, you know, if you hit 550 knots indicated and pop the speed brakes, she'll hold 550 until you stuff the dirt, pedo boom with dirt. It'll just oh, take wow. five. Because you're, you're building thrust on the way down. You're building drag on the way down. And so that's what I did. I started bombing at, uh, at uh, 550 and dropping at 6,000 feet instead of 5,000. So, uh, wow. So at, at this point, was, did you have like a standard, we call it the safe escape maneuver. Uh, so were you like trying to get, you know, certain parameters? I mean, you're just iron sight bombing. So your plan release, min release, or is it just eyeballing yeah, you it just, you drop? Just, you just eyeballed it and dropped it. And if you had a leader that, wow. that rolled in too far out and you're, I had one, I didn't have more than 20 degrees of dive. The guy just panicked. Well, crap. And, uh, you know, was, we had some people that, well, you know, you're a fighter pilot. You you got the best and the worst. Yeah, you know? yeah. Some people yeah. are given the best airplane, but they just don't belong in it. And I remember this one, just as shallow and, oh, it was terrible. I had two 3,000-pounders. I had had experience. Chet Griffin, who I checked out with, he's also out of Air Training Command, uh, retired as a full colonel, really a nice guy and a, and a super guy to fly with. We're going against the Wallach Airfield, and it's right at the edge of the SAM ring in Hanoi. So, and we're going in, you know, from south. So we're going to come off into the SAM ring, pulling off. He said, okay, guys, I'm going to give you a good steep roll in because we're tired of these shallow ones. So I don't know what I, what, I was lead of one of the flights. I guess we we're in the same squadron. No, he was in the 333rd, I believe. Anyway, I roll in and there's the airfield straight underneath me. I mean, oh. you know, so I'm coming down. I got the burner going straight down, unloading zero G. <laughs> And thinking, I got to drop. And so I did. I hit, I pickled, and I can't tell anything because there's no load on the airplane. I hear a bit of a thump, not much. And I go to pull, and the airplane gives it this. Holy Only crap. Only one bomb had come off. <clears throat> wow. So I got the right bomb on the right side. And thank God it's got a good rudder because there was no getting, no leveling it with aileron. And I got leveled off going right into Hanoi where everybody else is going home. So. <clears throat> I, I go out with a bomb, and because uh, I don't have time, I'm just recovering right now. I'm not looking at switches, and um, I figured out that I had all my switches right. And uh, I wait till we got over absolute raw jungle to pickle off the other one, I, and I pickled off hot because I didn't want that three thousand pound, you know, all that triton yeah. in there to to be used. And got home, and I turned off no switches except the master armament. They said, oh, you had your switches wrong, Captain. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Well, the next time this happened was on that real shallow dive bomb run. I mean, 20 <laughs> degrees maybe. And so I pickle and I go to pull and everything's fine because I don't have much of a pull. And this guy's underneath me, uh, Larry Evert, later got killed. But Larry says, don't roll out. Don't roll out. I'm right under you. You got a bomb on your right wing. <laughs> and, well, get out from under me. So I carry that with <laughs> pole. I was going to show him. I didn't touch any switches, not even my master yeah. armament switch, which I should have turned off. I didn't. And I brought that bomb all the way home. Thud doesn't care. It's got 3,000 pounds on one, bomb, one side. There's no, no difference. Thank I landed. I went through the arming area. I said, don't touch anything. Everything's hot. Somebody come up here and look. And look at my switches. And they did. They had a, they had a bunch of bad cartridges. That was all. those little tiny, you know, yeah. cartridges that kicked the bomb off. So I was vindicated. Did, oh. did you have to? What did, did you have to set a release pulse, or was it uh, multiple oh, pickles? We had uh, we could select uh, single uh, pairs or ripple, and we okay. with the with the with the uh, six bombs on the belly. It was ripple. Number five came off first. It's a ten millisecond interval with each. Oh, boop 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 boop. About you know it'd take what six, well five one hundredths of a second, or five. Mm -hmm. Five tenths of a second, uh, yeah, ten millisecond interval. So, for the five, for six of them to come off, that number five bomb that came off first, they often armed it with a um, delayed fuse, anywhere from whatever twelve to seventy-two hours, and it would sink itself into the you know into the dirt, and then when they're out repairing, it blow up. Wow! And they they no kidding. 
Yeah. They said, now these are 1940 fuses or 42, whatever. And um, they're, uh, they're pretty volatile and they may not, we don't know how fast they'll really, really go off because it depends on acid eating wave plastic over the time. I think that was what the deal was. So we are worried about these fuses. In fact, we had also a, a radar fuse, a radio type fuse that would, could be set for altitude. And one of those corked off when a guy pulled up to a tanker. And, oh uh, no! Yeah, so they put a they put a uh, metal snout on the rack uh, over the front of it, uh, so that it could not send its signal out until it was dropped. Uh, that was pretty bad. So anyway, this guy Chris Lawrence, who was uh, checked out with me also, out of training command, really wonderful guy, good pilot. They made him a force commander with six months less rank than me. They made me a force commander, but which was okay, which was I was one of the youngest. And then they took Chris, who was just barely made captain, and made him a force wow. commander for the big gaggle. But that's what General Gerardo did. The guy was good, he got the lead. Anyway, Chris is on my wing one day. He's number three, actually. There must have been two or four, because he's out on my right wing. Uh, we're sitting off a tanker going north over the Gulf of Tonkin. We take it on enough gas to make sure our tanks work. Now we're gonna go north a uh, hundred miles or so or two hundred and top off. And I look over at Chris's airplane and his number five bomb at the back, Got a, there's a plate screwed into the back of the bomb fin. And out from there is a propeller spinner on a cable mm -hmm. that goes in, you know, to arm the bomb. And this plate is backed off and it's just shaking a really wild. I say, hey, Chris, your, your uh, backing plate on your number five is, is loose and shaken. He says, is the spinner turning? I don't know. I'll come over and look. And I look and I, it's just a blur. I can't tell whether the wire is still in there or not. It's, I can tell it's backed off, but I don't know how far, with you know, yeah. fawn stock clips and all that. And uh, so I'm flying along, half fat, dumb and happy beside the tanker. And I look over, Chris is out about 500 feet out, and all six bombs come off. I say, uh, two, all your bombs came off. Yeah, I know I'm going home. Well, he told me later, I got thinking about that bomb and thinking about his wife and thinking about his kids and thinking about those 1942 fuses. He said, if I just hold the stick and hit the pickle button real quick. That number five will come off. That's all. They didn't tell us because guys were dropping like me on my first mission to only dropping two or three. They put a holding relay in the multiple ejector rack and didn't oh. tell anybody. They said later that after that happened with Chris, if there's a gold paint on the nose of your ejector rack, it's got a holding relay. That's how we found out to his embarrassment. Oh. And he was, he was the kind of guy, he didn't give himself a counter. He'd flown over the lower part of, well, going home, he flew over the northern part or southern part of Route Pack 1, but uh, didn't log a counter for that because he didn't do his bombs, you know, whatever. But uh, wow. <laughs> I got one other coming across, coming home. We didn't care much about anything over the southern part of North Vietnam. We're at 12, 14, 16,000 feet and doing 600 indicated coming home. Just coasting, really, for a thud. 600 indicated for three or 400 miles. And it was made to go that fast. And I'm flying in. We just, one time, we just crossed just below the DMZ. And I hear on guard, attention all aircraft, vicinity channel 109, heavy artillery, heavy artillery between the 290 to the 310 from 10 to 20 DME. All aircraft use caution to avoid. Da, da, da. You know, I think, hell, it's a big sky. Heavy artillery, a couple of 155s going up every five seconds. I don't hell, it's a big sky. I look out to my right, no more than a couple miles away, and here come 324 500 pound bombs out of a Ooh. cell of three B 52s. That was their heavy artillery. <laughs> So, yeah. So I get home telling me, you hear a heavy artillery advisory, you better you better believe it. <laughs> wow. Oh, well, geez. So, so going back to the, some of these deliveries, you know, we're talking about safe escape and stuff. Were guys fragging themselves, you know, going too low, no, not no, pulling I, off? Very, very few. Uh, generally, we're dropping it uh, at five or 6,000 feet. And, uh, okay. And I use, a lot of guys use a 7, seven we had a 7.33G, as you know, T-38 mm -hmm. then, and uh, fighters of that era, 7.33 was your G limit. And, but um, I like to use only four or five Gs. I would lose maybe 1,000 feet, but I'd save 100 knots in the pull-off. Also, the mm -hmm. thud would turn gray. It would just blow, explode with vapor. 
because the sharp points on it. It was not made to be a dive bomber. And you get that 7G pull in that humid air, and you just get vapor off the wings and off the canopy, almost almost cover the canopy in gray. And that would make you highlighted. And, you know, it's like that you put a target on a zebra, the lion's going to go after that zebra. So yeah. I like that slower wow. pull-off or uh, easier pull-off. Kept my, uh, my airspeed up. And, you know, we somehow everything goes left in the United States when it comes to racing and turning and all that. I yeah. like to do a jink to the right first, bring it up nice and easy, look around, plenty of time to see what's happening, and then join up. <clears throat> and join up is it? Well, you know, you're a fighter pilot. You know, when you brief and you say, okay, I'm going to pull off to the, to the left. I'm going to turn back easy right. I'm going to be at 5,000 feet and 600 knots. One, three, come in on the right with four. Two, get up on the outside. And if you're lead, you come off, you pull up like that, and you look, here comes three, here comes four, there's two. It just, just warms your heart, just thrills you, you know? Or if you're, again, if you're number two and lead is right where he said he would be, there it is. Oh, it's great. But one day, some wag at 7th Air Force, blue chip it was called, decided we're going to defuse the defenses at the Bok Yang Railroad Bridge. Okay, how do we do mm -hmm. that? We're going to have eight guys roll in from the from the left, and eight guys roll in from the right. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, now, no. Was, <laughs> and there's no way you can do it. You can't time it better. You can't. There's nothing. Well, we did it, and we pull off, and we are all over the sky heading out. We are six. You no, know, the, the weasels, they're out. They're probably laughing, but they're out there fighting with the Sams and having their, their fun. And we are going out 16 ships abreast. <laughs> and trying to line up. Now, how do you find out, you know, where's your leader? Well, you can't read on this, my little model up here, little tiny tail number. And you got the, the squadron, you know, R-U-R-K. That's big. But the best way you can identify them is by nose art. It, it distinguishes one from the other. So you can, if you remembered who you're flying with. But there's no way you can, you know, we're spread out by a thousand feet apart each. Guy calls all right, Wolf Light, this is Wolf Lead. I'm going to rock my wings. Now join on me. So as he rocks his wings, I'm Bear Lead. I rock my wings. Somebody else over here is rocking his wings. <laughs> it didn't work. He's, he's, all right, Wolf, listen up. This is Wolf Lead. I'm going to pull up and do a roll. Three other guys do a roll. <laughs> <laughs> we, got the, we got the tankers over at Gulf of Tonkin. There's six six thuds on one tanker. There's two on another. But we all got home okay. But... But that was <laughs> that was fun. You know, I mean, in the midst of this, you're being shot at and an airplane just went down. You listen to a beeper and you can still laugh. I don't know. It just uh, 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 but having a good airplane was a, uh, made it really very comfortable for us. How uh, fast was the thud? Was it a, it was a pretty uh, fast airplane? It was probably and probably even that. Now, the uh, the Vigi, they say, uh, might touch might top it in indicated airspeed because the Vigi did a thousand mile an hour show one time. Uh, but I think we were going to do, Republic was going to do a thousand mile an hour uh, run, but they got to do both mm -hmm. ways. They're going to do it in Death Valley on a winter day and so forth. And I think it would have done the thousand miles an hour. I don't know if it beat the, the Vigilante or not, but uh, it also, you know, the Vigilante also had the J75 engine by Pratt and Whitney. Uh, but I think it would have done it. We had an 810 knot limit airspeed to, to prevent melting of the canopy. We had actually a double yeah. canopy, but to melt the outer canopy. Uh, one buddy of mine said, how fast do you think it'll go? And I said, I don't know. I've been up to, you know, 700 indicated and, you know, there's nothing. Uh, but uh, he said, I got 818 today. We not only had the tape instruments, the vertical tape, we also had a digital readout. And that's where we got the 818. He was rolling on Fukin Airfield. Uh, this guy, Gary Olin, was uh, the guy who's really a wonderful fighter pilot, a good friend. And he's, his bombs didn't come off. Now, he's burner and boards coming down. So burner and boards, looking for 550 indicated. So I raised the speed brakes, and I start playing my switches. And finally, I said, I, the bombs aren't coming off. So he hit the master master uh, uh, arm, you know, the master uh, eject button, whatever. The, uh, dropped off everything. Dropped off his wing tanks, his... The, the metal ejector rack, the six bombs, ECM pods, everything came off the airplane and he leveled oh, off right down over the runway. And he said, that's where he saw 818. And uh, he said, it's flying fine. You know, the, the thud has uh, ailerons, conventional hydraulic ailerons. It also has spoilers. The spoilers are about, oh, I don't remember now, maybe 10 inches by, by 24. 
something like that. Mm -hmm. I think there's five spoilers in each wing. And the spoilers are on there to aid turning, but because it's something like 800 knots, the ailerons are locked out. Because if you put down an aileron at that high yeah. speed, it'll warp the entire wing in the wrong direction. So the ailerons get yeah. locked out at that massive, God, unbelievable speed. So all wow. in all, they Republic did a great job. They really did. How, how many tours did you uh, did you do in the the thud? I did. I did just the one tour. Got 102 missions uh, over the north. Uh, did one in the south where we dropped two 3,000 pounders with daisy cutters, you know, three foot fuse extenders. Uh, dropped the first. I dropped the first 3,000 pound bomb in South Vietnam. And 120 milliseconds later, I dropped the second one for a demonstration. Uh, that was kind of funny. We go down there uh, with Rick Conkey, a, 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 a weapons guy. We were tasked to test out 3,000 pounders of daisy cutters for landing zone preparation, LZ prep, to knock the trees down. So we did a couple of dummy tests with them and carried them and all and took photographs. I carried a photographer with me as we did uh, aborted pull-offs to see that the fuse extender, this two-inch pipe, 30 inches long, would not bend or anything. Went down over the uh, Laos and dropped, uh, Rick dropped some, he dropped two, and I was tasked to follow the bombs down to see about their trajectory. It's really funny. We we did like a regular dive bomb run, except I'm on his wing. Here we are, 550 knots, burner and boards, and I'm in 45 degrees. He drops the bombs. And you know, I never thought about this, but bombs fall at zero G. So all of a sudden I'm like this, you know. <laughs> Photographer <laughs> in the back is like that. And then I realized that these things are on a parabola to the center of the earth, to the vertical. So we pulled off. And the photographer, a young E3, really nice guy, said, shouldn't we go down low and take pictures of the trees down? Well, sure, okay. But you remember what he said about where the bad guys are, we're going to bail out, and what I told you about bailing out and so forth. So we went down real low and skidded on the side, and he got the pictures of all the, I mean, trees, massive things, just blown away, and no holes in the ground. You just wow. press the ground down. But uh, that was kind of fun. So then we go to South Vietnam and we go and do a demonstration there. I'm up north of uh, Play Coup and the FAC has found the biggest trees he can find. So he says, do you want to smoke? I says, yep. I saw where he was. And uh, I said, I'm going to back off and, and I'll call you when I'm about two or three miles out. And you give me a smoke because I want to hit, you know, really good. So I go way back and I get up to 440 indicated. I get about two miles away. I light the burner. I'm up to about 500 indicated. I got the smoke. I roll over and my combining glass, you know, my gun sight, bomb sight, is filled with little airplanes down there. Want to see what this big thud's going to do. Helicopters and O1s and O2s and A1s. As you better get these little airplanes out of the way. I'm going to drop right about now. Boop, boop. And I pull off. I roll over. Two big overlapping shock waves all turned into vapor. And out of the vapor, all these little airplanes going away as fast as they could. <laughs> 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 that's awesome oh that was uh that was something so the next day they have a warning you know they called it whatever some kind of target name or or operational name <laughs> to avoid by five nautical miles yeah. that's that's awesome these are how all the notes warnings and cautions get developed from mm -hmm. st <laughs> stories exactly. like this somebody doing something <laughs> stupid yeah <laughs> that's that's awesome mm -hmm. So from the from the thud, where'd you go, or at least from Vietnam, where'd you go yeah. next? I went back. I for the day I got to uh, talk leave because our missions are hundred missions normally only six months. We forecast the day we got there, and I put in for Laughlin because I knew the war would be over. Uh, it's like this. Uh, it's a, a spurious uh, audio of uh, Shark Bait Two One calls up a, while taxiing up. You can tell the tower you can shut down this afternoon because the war is going to be over because shark baits going to war or whatever. Anyway, I figured the war would be over and should have been, of course, but wasn't because of McNamara and Johnson. But we won't talk politics today or I'll get angry and and uh, throw my beer on the, you know, break my glass. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, uh, let's keep I, it. I, yeah. I, I forecast for Lawson because I wanted to go back as an instructor pilot and went back. And went back my 100 mission patch. So I, I had I had the kids in awe just like I was when I first saw it. And went back and I did again T-37s, T-41s, and standardization uh, stand of L. And then got orders to the F-111. And uh, oh, wow. checked, out, checked out at Nellis. And uh, quite an amazing machine. But 
Republic could have made 15 new thuds that would have turned with an F4E. They were going to add four feet of wing to each end, each eight feet of wing altogether. They were going to do away with the big bomb bay and the 2,000-pound kicker that would throw a nuke out, make it a full monocoque fuselage. Instead of 390 gallons of fuel in the bomb bay, they could put 500. They could take a couple thousand pounds off the airplane, put a big turbo fan in it, big fan jet so it'd have much better it wouldn't go supersonic at low level but it'd sure go fast and um could put in terrain following radar not terrain avoidance radar which we had and uh all for one and a half million dollars because the, the line was still available the money would wow. all be in a new engine but re, uh, mcnamara won the 111. so it was a good airplane real slow pardon me with the wings forward flaps down a lot of high lift and once it was up about 500 knots, again, a very good airplane. The terrain following radar was awesome. When I, I got in the airplane, I'm checking out on my first landing. I uh, can't remember the guy's name. I should. But anyway, we have a 30-knot direct crosswind. That was limit. I'm in the left seat. He's an IP and I whistle in the right seat. And I says, you want to take this thing with this uh, with this wind? No, you're doing fine. So it uh, it does not have ailerons. It's got spoilers and a variable tail and uh crosswinds are are not fun with it because it you tend to over control you tend to put in too much too much uh yeah. spoiler with a drag too much of the uh, of the uh variable tail and so forth so i'm coming down anyway at the maximum and i dragged the tail skid cost me a case of beer and uh, don what was his name anyway he wouldn't he wouldn't share the case of beer with me but i still have that tail skid uh, 20 feet away from here at my armoire with all the scratches <laughs> on. But the guy was showing me this terrain falling radar. There is south of Nellis, probably still there, there's a moving uh, sand dune. It's a conical shaped sand dune. The sand is all rounded off, just like the sand in Saudi Arabia from all the winds. That's why Saudis import sand for concrete because their sand is all rounded and won't, won't adhere. And we aim at it and we fly right beside it and we see its altitude. We turn around and go back 20 miles out, and we set, it's at 430, 430 feet above the, the uh, desert. We set our train following at 500 feet. We fly toward this thing, and the radar doesn't even see it until we get overhead. And then the uh, radar altimeter sees it and gives a 3D pitch up. And he says, uh -oh. that's why you, you have to be very careful flying over desert and flying in powder snow, and light rain, because the radar won't see it. Uh, they, that's how I found out that the uh, one of them was lost in Southeast Asia, was the very dense but very small uh, droplets scattered the radar, and one went into the uh, in a snow, in a saddle of snow uh, in Utah, I think it was, but anyway, in the Southwest, and powder snow scattered the radar. So they, they did things with a polar, secular polarization, and it, it got to where it could see the, see the rain and Give you an automatic fly up the radar was so good the guy says to me we're at 500 feet you see where that train is way out there yeah i can see a railroad train he says can you see those open open doors in the box cars what i can't i, I can barely tell the box cars look at my radar i look over at his you know it is he takes a hood off the radar and you could actually see through the open wow. doors in a box car miles away so it was a wonderful radar and uh very capable airplane. It could have done the nuke, nuke delivery very, very well. I have no doubt. Um, and I got to fly it for two years in uh, in England. Truly enjoyed the UK. Uh, bad weather, but but had a good time flying it there. Um, no problems with it. We had one time smoke in the cockpit. It, designers are, I don't know, you got to wonder about them sometimes. The, uh, the ADI, the Attitude Directional Indicator, had a five-watt light bulb in it. The only five mm -hmm. or five, five volt, sorry, five volt light bulb. And under my seat was a transformer. The transformer burned up. We got smoke. Uh, but uh, that was the only, only problem I ever had. I got to fly it later in Thailand. Um, I met, uh, met Dana while I was in the staff college. And I said to a guy in the class with her, I said, hey, Earl, I've got some more Budweiser in my truck if you want a beer during break. And Sweet Things from Prattville, Alabama says, you got some beer in your truck, <laughs> so so we had beer in my truck uh, every uh, every after every class for a couple of weeks, and then she said, 
just suppose we got serious about each other. Can I go to Thailand with you? Because I knew I was going. So I was I was hooked. And 46 years later, I'm still hooked. So she joins awesome. me in Thailand and had a, a good time over there flying. Um, she never saw me fly. She'd come out the flight line and be waiting, and I'd walk in after an abort. And she'd come out to the flight line to see me take off, and here I come walking with my helmet. And, you know, <laughs> we've aborted again. But uh, we were down in, in uh, Bangkok. Getting, she's getting her visa renewed, as the wives had to do. And uh, we hear about the Maya guest thing. The Cambodians have stopped one of our cargo ships, and we're going to war again. Oh, crap. You know, a chance for another combat mission. Well, a day <laughs> later, I think it's all over. Well, it wasn't. I got to fly on the last day in a 111, and I got four uh, Mark, uh, Mark uh, 84s, the 2,000-pound bombs. Navy developed good bombs, great bombs. Anyway, take off those four 2,000-pound bombs on board and head down there. Got a tanker waiting for me. Get over the island, Koh Tang, where the uh, the Marines had come in. And typical Marines, they land on one side of the island. They've got to go to the other side of the island. You know, read the thin red line by Jones. They've got to go across the island. And, of course, the crew of the Maya Gez wasn't even there. And the Cambodians had already said, we're going to put them back. We, we don't want the ship. It's okay. It's all over. Oh, no. You know, we got our fangs out, so we got to show those Cambodians. And the island was heavily, heavily armed against the North Vietnamese trying to take over Cambodia because Saigon had already fallen. And, and so, had not, you know, so had Laos. And they're worried. So anyway, that was why it's heavily armed. So we go down there, and we're waiting high and dry. And F-4 says, hey, i got to get some gas. I can't, uh, can't make it back to Udorn. And I said, hey. He can have a thousand pounds of mine. So so and so gets a thousand. Well, two ship. They get a thousand pounds each, and they go down and drop their damn bombs before they go home. We're still holding up there. A couple of A sevens. Hey, we need some more gas. Yeah, they can take some because we, you know, one eleven fly forever. Finally, we get cleared, and uh, we are. It's now getting dark, and we're heading to, to line up to roll in. We got our coordinates, and we start losing. We lost our radar, lost everything, basically, to do the bombing. So we figured out we'll hit feet dry. We can see where there's surf. We'll hit feet dry, and two seconds later, we'll drop the bombs. And then this guy, Bob Jones, out of my my squadron, shows up. Hey, Jones, we called him, Jones Jones. Uh, let me get on your wing. Here's a target. Here's the coordinates. We get on his wing, and we're at about 2,000 feet, and dropping them slick and going to pull high to get off out of the frag. And... Uh, Get on his wing, and we just hit feet dry, and the fact calls, hey, go through dry. Do not drop. The last Marine is off the island. Well, it turned out oh. it wasn't. Tragically, there were still three left. What happened? There were three groups of three. Three get picked up in the middle, call their buddies in from the right. The guys from the right got picked up, didn't know that there were three on their left, and they were left and, and later killed. But anyway, going through on Bob Jones' wing, I was probably, what, eight, eight I don't know, 111. 10 feet behind him, I end up as the last fighter pilot in combat in Southeast Asia on the 15th of May, 1975. So, wow. That's for wow. what that's worth. Went Jeez. through Trido. Oh. Was not the last, was not the last combat though. The last combat would have been the FAC in an OV-10 who was being fired at by 50 cal, quad 50s probably, every time he made a pass down the side of the, uh, the island. And we could see the tracers, and they look like a water hose curving. Of course, they're not really curving. You know, they're being swung. And they're, I'm sure they saw plenty of lead with the tracers going out, but they all went behind them. And then the last combat uh, drop was with a C-130. And he said, I've got to drop these bombs, this bomb. I can't get home without, you know, if I don't get rid of it. Uh, he was out of Udorn, as was I. And uh, no, I was out of Karat, sorry. Anyway, so he drops the bomb, and he calls, bomb away. <laughs> what the hell is that? So I got the airplane laid on its side and I got my camera out and all of a sudden it just this big kind of reddish flash and then it's, it's obscured again by this big vapor cloud. And the facts, well, I'll give you a hundred over a hundred on that. Say your ordinance drop. And he says, oh, I'm from zero, zero. Is that one five zero zero pounds propane? Negative one five zero 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 pounds propane <laughs> that'd run your barbecue a wow. long time wow yeah. Jeez, well, was, Louise. Yeah. yeah that's a um how many hours did you have in the thud by the way um 
about 500 total, a little under 500. Right. Yep. We got uh, yeah. three, three, three plus hours going refueling over Green Anchor over Laos and four plus hours going up over the Gulf of Tonkin on Brown Anchor. Yeah. I got one for you about the difference in leadership, which, oh, God help us today. But anyway, uh, my first wing commander there, as I said, he was a, a bit of a prig. And anybody who knows who was there before Gerardo will know. I will give him credit. He did fly in World War II and uh, P-51s, and he did fly his 100 missions over the north. But we're coming off the Gulf of Tonkin. We've just turned in after dropping off from our tankers and going north, well north of Haiphong. We're just coming feet dry, about 50 or 60 miles to the west, above the to the northwest of Hanoi and uh, up above the Red River. Robin Olds is flying. And uh, all of you know the stories of Robin Olds. And Olds calls out in a very distinctive voice. Now, he's already got four kills, four known kills. And I think he probably gave away this kill. But he said, <clears throat> I want to quote him directly. Hey, anybody up over here by the, anybody up here by the dog pecker, in particular, Ben in a river, a MiG-17 just went in. Who got it? And my wing commander, 40 or 50 miles away, shouts, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah. One's a professional, the other a careerist. Yeah. Wow. Did, did you have any interactions with any air-to-air -air threats while you were there? <laughs> I, we roll in one day. Colonel McDonald, again, my squadron commander, nice guy. He's, we're going up against a target. It's a beautiful day. I got a tape recording. I'm trying to get it re reconstructed. I'm talking to my mother. It's a beautiful day. You can see for miles and miles. Uh, the sun's beating down the back of my neck. And even with the air conditioner full cold, I can feel the warmth. Um, went on with that. Told her I was, it's so stable. I think I could touch wingtip lights without breaking them. I mean that, really. If lead was on autopilot, you could do it. Anyway, uh, I think I'm comfortable enough. I can hear my breathing later. I'll check out my respiration, see if I was in a panic, Mom, but I think I'm cool, cool enough. Colonel Mack is heading toward another target. It's a, one of those, you know, it's real clear. You tend to overshoot your target, and he's going past it. Uh, Bear lead. Three's got the target at 11 o'clock. Uh, Bear uh, targets at 10. Bear lead targets it at 9. Three's in. I roll over the top. And about two miles away, same altitude, are two MiG-17s. I try to hold the airplane up in the air, and it says, oh, no, we're going to go bomb. And it just it just <laughs> fell over. It's, you know, <laughs> it's impossible with, with bombs and, and bombs on board and fuel in the drop tanks still in the wing tanks. Uh, she wasn't going to stay up there. So that was the nearest I ever came. Wow. I did on, on my first, I guess when I – led the whole force, the whole gaggle one day. We're heading out, and there's a couple of MiG-21s behind us about oh, five or six miles back, and they're scalloping, leaving little scallops of contrails off their wingtips. Because about 450 indicated, they become unstable. And we're doing you know, we're doing 550 indicated. Just walk away from them. Don't even, don't even bother with the burner. That's awesome. And you don't turn into them, that's for sure, you know. And Now, guys that had wow. to, when they got to where they were tapped and, and did, have some marvelous stories. Uh, our weasels one day got three MIGs. Air Force only gave credit for two. But if you look at the videos, the tapes, their, their gun camera, and the shoots coming down, I think they got all three. Um, Dave Waldrop, a one, first lieutenant, uh, one of my former student pilots, in fact, at Laughlin, he got two in one day and got, shot one of them right out from in front of Olds. And Olds gave him credit for it. The Air Force gave him only one. But uh, Olds tried to give him credit for the second one and saw it. But uh, Wow. Yeah. Olds was, wow. Olds was something else. He was just, he was wonderful. God, it was good to be in the sky with him. There's no, nobody else over there like him. Yeah. Wow. Did you get to meet him? Oh, yeah. I met him a number of times. He'd say, Pio, what are you doing with the damn mustache? <laughs> and, of course, the mustache ended up 12 and a quarter inches long. Hold on one here. <laughs> That's in November of 67. Wow. And I stayed so, on three more months, so you can get an idea how long it was. That was just just after my 100 missions. Now, yeah. now what made you grow the mustache? Oh, um, when I was going through, through pilot instructor training, my instructor was a very senior captain. And uh, I'm trying to grade him 
on his clover leaf or his loop or something and fill out a grade slip on him. And I don't know, did he really try to do the best loop he could? He's going to be upset if I critique it or did he mess up a little bit to see if I could catch it? And two of my buddies are at the sides of the table as well. And people start to giggle and laugh. And I realize, pardon me, I've got a cigarette in, burning in the ashtray. I've got one in my mouth. I'm trying to light another one. I put all three out. I quit. And I said, I'm going to grow a mustache. And that will be, if I ever smoke again, I'll cut the mustache off. So I already had a tiny, just barely within limits mustache when I got my orders. So it was, it was almost this long when I got to Thailand six months later. Um, wow. And <laughs> I got back to Laughlin. The uh, deputy for ops had become now the wing commander. Well, welcome back, pilot. I see you still got your mustache. Said, yes, sir. Kind of long, isn't it? I said, sir, I cut four inches off of it two weeks ago. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> keep it two more weeks and cut off four more inches. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, awesome. And, you know, um, so, you know, Mover, what I did with the four inches, the two inches off each side, yeah. I had waxed them up, put them in a, in a medicinal vial. And if we're going to have a dining in or something, you know, some kind of a hoorah, I would wax them back in and have it this long. Again. <laughs> nice. Ah, yeah. oh, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, the, the, the fighter pilot culture back then was so much different. I mean, oh. you, you guys had roll calls, dining in. Like, what was oh, that yeah. like? Oh, the uh, when I went through pilot training at Willie, anytime you made a mistake, it cost you five boners. And that was five beers. So every Friday, we'd pay off. We have cases of beer in the flight room. Um, when we got on the boom bucket, the uh, T-3070 ejection seat trainer, the guy that went the highest bought a case of beer. The guy who went the lowest bought a case of beer. Um, flying safety meeting at the club. We would meet outside by the swimming pool at the old club. And after the, after the meeting, we'd have two kegs of beer. And you drink that, and everybody calls their wives and come out and then drink some more. Um, and somehow we survived it all. The stag bars were truly stag bars. At Talk Lee, the only female ever in there was, was bringing in buckets of ice. And Thai girl would work, work in there, come in, dump it. I was in a stag bar one night. The bar was, oh, I got to look. My bar is eight and a half feet long, about 15 feet long, probably, with an L to a side door outside. And we're in the afternoon and not on the, most of us were pretty sober. If we're flying the next day, we stayed pretty sober, took it seriously. Some guys didn't, but most did. The door to the outside opens up and it was like a vampire convention. Everybody's, you know, no, no, you know, the light comes in. And coming in, silhouetted, is a grunt major. And I don't mean to disparage the people that support us, but a non flying major and this very shapely, pretty young blonde. And I said from the far end of the bar, and I got a good command voice, not OCS, we learned that. She looks like a very nice girl, but I want to know what the, the round eyed is doing in my stag bar. And uh, the major took her right out. She became the wing commander's secretary. We became good friends, liked her very much. I saw her probably four years later in San Antonio. And I said to her, Vicki, I still remember the first time I saw you. She said, yes, John, I remember the first time I ever heard you. <laughs> but, uh, well, but those days are okay. gone uh yeah yeah sadly and uh my daughter is one of the most frustrated young captains you'd ever want to meet and uh because of the lack of leadership and i just i feel for her, i hurt for her uh better pilot than i am more professional probably than i ever was and uh she just just cannot believe the lack of leadership that she faces in a guard unit, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's a, that's a whole other subject that doesn't belong here. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that is a different discussion. However, it is yeah. absolutely correct, and we could yeah. talk about it for another couple hours. But I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'd mm -hmm. like to get to the F-111. Um, you only did that for two years? Uh, I did it for, uh, for two years in England, and then uh, for a, uh, about a seven months of my tour in Thailand when the, on the Maya Gives thing. Yeah. Well, um, what was the mission for the F-111? Like, what were uh, you, nuke, nuke especially strike. in Europe? Nuke, nuke strike. Uh, okay. Drop it uh, 200 feet, hard hard ride, 3G up, 0G down, automatic terrain following. And it would do that automatic terrain following. Uh, two nukes uh, with strikes in Eastern Europe. 
And um, I, I can tell you honestly, I don't remember my targets anymore. They were top secret. I've forgotten them. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, but uh, I remember, no, I don't remember what they were. Rail yard? Yeah. If it was, it'd be a big marshaling yard. I don't remember. I do remember one guy. I won't give his name because he gave away the target. But uh, he had a massive rail yard in one of the countries in Eastern Europe. And he said, just outside the rail yards is where my grandparents live. And I said, my gosh, how could you do that? He says, hey, they're going to die anyway, you know. So uh, fortunately, uh, we weren't we weren't needed. We weren't called on. But we could have done the job, I have no doubt. Now, we may not have had a base to land at coming home. But uh, yeah. there's no doubt we could have got the target with that airplane. It was it was really a big part of the Cold War, and it really gave the Russians pause because there's no way they could have stopped us at, at 600 knots, 200 feet. Uh, turn yeah. the radar on every 10 seconds just to update the inertial nav system, which itself was was awesome. Yeah, it would have done a good job. But uh, then after right. that, you know, uh, gosh, what did I do? I uh, I came back to Laughlin, went to the 111, uh, came back to, uh, went up to Udo, got up to command post, came back to instruct at the staff college, and then off to Iran for the revolution. That's another story. Didn't fly over whoa, there. Whoa. I was an advisor well, there. What's that, what's that story? Well, that sounds I, interesting. Well, I became an advisor to their staff college. I left our staff college and went to become yeah. an advisor. That's that's worth a whole other uh, a whole other hour mover, but yeah, uh, yeah. But then came back and uh, uh, waited for five months to get orders because the Air Force, the State Department, DOD, nobody knew Iran was going to fall. I mean, just it was just yeah. horrible. Jimmy Carter gave it away, and we all knew it was going. Finally, got orders to the. Uh, the, uh, the uh, fighter lead in AT 38s out of the Holloman. And that was wonderful. Nice, not much airspace, but nice clean airspace. Our students or our trainees were all top of their class. And uh, that was beautiful to be back in the 38. And uh, I remember one night we didn't keep night qualification except for a couple of people. So I'm a squadron ops officer. I'm going to be night current. So we go out to get night current and there's a, uh, we go out first, we hassle the two V two for a while. Then we break up to uh, as it gets dark. And I'm leading, and it's dark, sun's down, and I do an aileron roll or a barrel roll, and there's the sun. And then it oh. disappears. And up again, there's the sun. And I gave it to two, and he takes me around. And we did that twice till the sun's finally down. And I am up in front with another, another uh, instructor, and I am just giggling. I said, My God, can you believe they pay us to do this? And they even put the gas in the airplane, you know? So that was a heck of a lot of fun. So that's awesome. Retired, thought I was going to fly F-86s doing dart tow, target tow in Okinawa. A uh, guy hired a couple of his buddies, not me. Uh, spent a couple of years in a small business. They made no money. And I had to do something to get back, to, you know, support three young kids. So I called up the executive secretary of the River Rats. I had been the sink rat of the rats in 83, 84. I called Patty Sheridan. Patty, you know anybody who's doing anything? Call Bob Gad. He was the sink rat before me. So I called Bob. He said, yeah, my brother, you know, my brother, Dick. I said, yeah, I do. He's got something going south of your place. So I called Dick. He said, yeah, I got something about 400 miles south of your location. I'm in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Hmm. That sounds like Central America somewhere. It's all friendly skies, but if you cross the border, you'd be well paid. Do you have any time in a C-123? No. <laughs> You'll check out in a month. No problem. So I, I, ran, guns <laughs> with, I, I ran guns to the Contras for Ollie North for five months. Holy crap. And uh, pay my bills. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Hassenfuss, they had the Hassenfuss shoot down. That ended. Um, that flew Lears on a jamming contract. Uh, they had tow target and jamming. I hassled with F-15s in Iceland, three different TDYs. That was wonderful. Fly formation with them, 3V2. I'm a Russian bomber, and, and they're supporting me. God, that was a hell of a lot of fun. But they cut the pay, so uh, dropped that, and then uh, then did uh, oh anti drug flying in South America, uh, C one twenty three in Colombia and uh, and Peru, and that was for an old slow truck after coming out of fighters. That was really really fun. It was a heck of a lot of fun. It's a great old truck, and then came back uh, to the states, and I did fourteen years of surveillance flying in Cessna O two the or the three three seven. 
and uh, finishing up in the rocks just before I turned 75. So all in all, wow. Mover, it was a hell of a fun ride. And I am so thankful to everybody along the way that, you know, the mechanics I worked with, gosh, you've got to love these guys. You know, the thud, that flat paint, camouflage paint, you could not put your hand on it without blistering it. I'm serious. You couldn't. Uh, it was just, God, it was awesome. If you got another 10 minutes, I got a little tale for you. We've got we've got as much time. We started early just for this reason. We got plenty. Well, it's your time, sir. All right. Please continue. Having been, having been enlisted, I think I gave me a real feel for the enlisted guys and having seen outstanding officers from my perspective as an enlisted guy. Uh, a Lieutenant Wilson was a first lieutenant when I met him in a rescue C-47 squadron, did JATO takeoffs. Uh, and uh, imagine a C-47 taking off in 300 feet, climbing like that. <laughs> That's another tale. That was a heck of a lot of uh, just a wonderful squadron. My time enlisted in their rescue was good. But this Lieutenant Wilson was just so damn good to me and so demanding of me. Um, I couldn't get away with anything around him. Learned out, learned later, he's an ex-tech sergeant. Well, I really cared for the enlisted guys. On the day that we flew that Dimmer Bridge mission, there were probably a couple hundred guys on the flight line reconfiguring those airplanes. And it's 95 degrees, 90% 90 humidity or worse, you know. And they're out there, oh, bare-chested, can't touch the airplane. It's so blistering hot. After it was all over, I wrote up a uh, commendation medal for all their work. And what did I get out of wards and decks? Oh, they're going to get one anywhere for being here. I said, look, this was an Air Force cross mission for Colonel Bob White, the X-15 guy who led us. And it was, you know, it was a yeah. silver star for the colonels and, you know, DFC for, you know, us. But anyway, these guys really did it. Now they're going to get one anyway. So what I could do, the best I could do was make onion skin. You remember, no copiers then, you know, except Thermofax. I made onion skin copies and went out in the flight line with a, hundred of these. Were you on that mission that day? Were you working here? This is the best I can do for you. Gave them the citation to accompany the award of, but I really cared for it. So wow. the first day that they hit the uh, um, Fukin airfield, the largest airfield, well, next largest, Kialam was the largest, but we never hit it. That's where the POWs came back from. The day the other guys hit the Fukin airfield, Mal Winter, again, the same guy was number four or number two in that flight with me on the Doomer, uh, said, we got a bunch of money collected here for the airmen that put us onto that wonderful target, but we all got to fly tomorrow morning. And I'd already had my hundred. No, I didn't have my hundred yet. But anyway, I was off. I said, I'll take it over to the airmen's club and give them the $40, whatever to buy beer. Well, I get my hundred missions done with Lonnie Ferguson, retired as a two-star, nicest guy ever, modest, long-time fighter pilot, F-105 guy. I'm brand new out of T-37s, and we flew our first mission together and our last together. It's wonderful being with him. We finish our mission, so we we buy the bar in the old club. We have a squadron dinner. We stand up and pontificate a bit, and then we're going to the Airmen's Club. We get over there. There's a little band playing, a little GI band. And this master sergeant, I guess he was, senior guy behind the bar, says, uh, can I help you, gentlemen? I said, no, we want to buy the bar. Oh, shut up the band. Go tell them. No, I'll wait till they're finished. They get through. And Fergie says, John, you go up and make the announcement, you know, because I'm pretty shy. So, all right. So I go up to make the announcement. <laughs> I said, hey, guys, can I have your attention, please? And there's this murmur, you know, that low murmur, like, what in the hell are you guys doing in our club? We can't go to yours. Yeah. I say, I'm, I'm Captain Pyle. I'm here with Major Lonnie Ferguson. And um, yeah, so what? You know, you hear that murmur. And we just finished our 100 missions today. Or tonight, in fact. It was just dark. We got home. The murmur's a little more respectful. And sort of thank all you guys who crewed the airplanes, put the bombs on, fueled them, guarded the flight line, paid us, give us our next orders, everything you've done for us to make it possible. We want you to belly up the bar. The bar, the beer's on us. All of a sudden, nice. hey, Captain Major, welcome to our club. <laughs> <laughs> Mover, we bought 940, awesome. 954 bottles or cans of beer. There were steel cans in. Ooh. 954 of them. Thank God it was dime beer night. So so we're there drinking beer. And this one kid comes up to me and beside me. It's crowded, man. There And only two guys back there popping the cans open, steel cans with church keys. Who knows what a church key is today? Anyway, he says, Captain, can I buy you a beer? I said, yeah, I'll take a Falstaff. Because the Falstaff Brewery was sending films over every week of, of the NFL games. 
And we would we would uh. wait, not listen to the to Armed Forces Radio, try to avoid looking at the Stars and Stripes so we could see the games fresh. And people today don't know that, you know. You had to send yeah, yeah. the film over and show it on a projector. So, hey, they'll send the films. So I'll buy their beer. So the sergeant pops a beer for me, signs it out. The kid signs a dime out on the bar. The sergeant shoves it back. He's already paid for. He says, I don't care. I'm buying the captain a beer. Shoves it up. He said, you don't understand. They're paid for. And he used some bad words we won't use on here. He says, I'm <laughs> buying the captain a beer. He says, I've already closed out the till. I can't take your money. He says, you can take this dime and shove it up. You know, So he took the dime and I bought the, I drank the beer. Young man next to me says, sir, would you tell me about a mission? So I told him about one. Get up in the morning, go to the big community shower. Same same routine every morning, all that goes. And shave, shower, get dressed, ride my bike down to the flight line, down to the briefing and and take off, bomb, come back, and so forth. And he says, wow, that's really something. He says, you know, I don't have anything to do with the mission. I says, what do you mean? He says, I'm not a crew chief or a bomb loader or anything like that. I just work in finance. I said, you just work in finance. Let me tell you something. I had 50 missions. In that time, 13 of my buddies were dead or prisoners. And what am I going to do to say that I am going to survive 50 more and they won't? The next day, I am behind a flight force commander. I'm a deputy force commander, and he's coming up out of well, another base. Stan, no, uh, you know this, out of Stan of Al. He knows all, and he's going yeah. to lead. And we're going to bomb. I don't like his tactics. I forget whether we're going to hit the Fukin airfield and then pull off of the rail yard or hit the rail yard and pull off of the airfield instead of overflying the first one to the second. So we're going to be right. really vulnerable. The weather is supposed to be horrible. The SAMs have been really, really bad. The MIGs have been active, and I am scared. Go to the briefing, and I don't – in fact, I was. This is true. I, I flew the entire mission the night before in almost real time in my bed. I was scared for the first time. I was nervous before my first mission. Now I am frightened. I'm frightened. I'm mm -hmm. going to die. I can't. I don't. I don't deserve to live, you know. And these other guys are dead. Anyway, I get to the flight line, and there's nobody by my airplane. I go next to the revetment next to, to it, and here's a guy sitting there reading a letter that's been folded and unfolded. I say, Chief, you got the airplane next door? He says, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I get over there and he hands me the forms that tell how the airplane's doing. It's covered with hydraulic fluid, red hydraulic fluid. There's a big leak out of the side of the airplane. He gives me some stuff about, about the leak and being fixed and all. And I, I don't understand any of this. I get in the airplane and it starts thumping on the way out, taxing out, boom, boom. And it gets worse as we head toward the target. It gets so bad that I'm distracted and shot down. And somebody else has to come back the next day, and he's shot down. Now, why was he looking at that letter? He has come to your office in finance an hour or two before, and you're busy. you got your papers all weighted down, the fan blowing, no air conditioning there, big fan blowing. He won't go away. He's standing in front of your counter. Yeah, what do you need? He said, hey, I just, I just got this, this letter from my wife, and, and she hasn't got her allotment. Now, people today won't understand this, but in those days, the GIs in the States were paid by check, but overseas paid in cash once a month. Wives got the housing allowance, which for him, if he was a three-striper with over four years, was $71 a month to live on for housing and a part of his base pay. And it took a long time for this to be established. No computers going in at that time. And he says, she hasn't got her allotment. Ah, it takes a long time. How long you been here? About six weeks. Yeah, she's probably got it now. Don't worry about it. But 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 the rent's due in this letter. He said, hey, like I told you, it takes a long time. I meet up with him down at the flight line. Now, let's back up. He comes in to your office, stands in front of the counter. He's important because it's Talk Lee Tyler in 1967. Yeah, he can help you. Yeah, I just got this letter from my wife, and she hasn't got her allotment. Well, that's pretty bad. Okay, how long How long you been here? About six weeks. Yeah, damn it, they're taking about that long, but, uh, oh, crap. Now, it takes two weeks to find out, you know, letter back and forth. I'll tell you what, let's go over to the Red Cross right now. Where is she living? She's in Salina. Oh, that base housing over there in Kansas. Yeah, all right, that's good because we've got Red Cross at McConnell. We'll go over there. We'll send the Twix. 
what, what, what's a Twix? It's like a telegram. We'll find out if she's got it. Uh, is there any problem with her getting it at 8 o'clock at night? No, no, it's okay. Well, that's what time it is in Kansas. Okay, we'll send this Twix to her. Can, can you wait? Because it'll go first to the Red Cross. They actually have to go to your house. So, okay. Is that, so it's going to be a couple hours. Well, that's okay. i got to launch an airplane. All right. Look, when you get back here, how long it take? Uh, probably two, three hours. By that time, we ought to have an answer back from your wife. You come back here, and we'll know. If she's got the allotment, great. If she doesn't, we'll go back over to the Red Cross, and we'll send the money to her. But you can't. It takes two weeks. No, 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 no. Look, I'll give you a partial pay right now. You take it over there. And they'll send, it's like a money gram, like a Western Union. You know how that goes? Okay. So, okay. See you in a couple hours. All right. Thank you. Okay. Got it. I come down to my airplane. Remember, I'm scared. Here's a guy standing by the airplane. Got the forms. Gives me a sharp set. Morning, Captain. How you doing? I said, well, I hope okay. Uh, how are you doing? Oh, I had a problem with a lot with my wife, but uh, can I help you? No, finance guy, finance guy, all taken care of. It's all right. We walk around the airplane. He said, I'm sorry, I got hydraulic fluid. All, I had all over me. We had a bad leak. Come around the side. He said, I've been wiping it off. and said, you know, it's a double panel here, this side of the, the engine bay. And there's fluid inside. I can't get a wash cart to wash it out. But we've leak checked it, got it solved. There was a bad O-ring. We got it sealed up, got it pressure checked. Uh, so it'll be okay. It's not a hot spot, so don't have to worry about fire. And so we walk on around. He says, oh, he says, one of the problems is they took away the mule, the hydraulic pressure cart, before I could purge the system. So there's a lot of air in the system. And every time that air goes by an actuator, you're going to get a thumping with the speed brakes and the eyelids on the, you know, the, the taxing, the steering. And this thumping will get worse and worse because the bubbles will all coalesce and the thumping will be monstrous. And he says, so what you got to do while you're taxing out, Operate the speed brake. Just hit it again and again and again. Those speed brakes will come open and close. That'll run that hydraulic fluid through there. And if all that bubbles, all that air is going to come in the accumulator. It'll be vented out. It'll be really fine. Don't have to worry about it. But you got to do that all the way while you're taxing out. Okay, got it. I said, do you see the difference? It was crying. It was crying. So yeah. we owe it to the people who work on our airplanes and support us in every other way, they need to understand what we do and that we appreciate them because we're the only people on the base. I did that. I spoke at my daughter's graduation. I said, you're the most important person on the base because you fly airplanes, but you're the only one on the base who can't do her job without everybody else. They can all there do their job day after day without you. You need them and you need to let them know that you appreciate them. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's a hundred percent, hundred percent correct. And we lose sight of that. Yeah. Still today yeah. we lose sight of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that's a good story that's applicable right now. Like yeah. not even it, it's timeless. You know, the, the little people, they do make a difference. I was, when I was enlisted, I was working in life support, personal equipment, went TDY to Alaska and this major is giving me a big bunch of crap. The coffee was too strong. You know, and just, well, all right. So they were flying B-50s. There was a thermos up front, a thermos in the back. And I put an O-meter on the thermos connector to see if it was would heat up. Oh, this one didn't work. And the coffee was too strong. He got some very weak coffee. And damn it, that thermos, that big one-gallon thermos, Apparently the heater didn't work. You know, you don't mess with little people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, don't, <laughs> don't. Uh, yeah. Well, so going back to gun running, can you talk about that? Is that, are, yeah. are there stories from that? Because that actually sounds <laughs> like uh, uh, exciting just by itself. Oh God, move is required. I don't know. This requires another pretty long pull here on the IPA. You, you got to recharge. You got to okay, recharge. Right. I got, yeah. Yeah, you got anything I mean, there? Any <laughs> I, I'm, okay. I'm still good over here. I'm, I'm, I'm just listening, so it doesn't take as much. All right. So, I call, uh, I call Patty Sheridan, the executive secretary of the River Rats. She puts me in touch with Bob Gad, puts me in touch with Dick Gad, and uh, he hires me. So I go up to, uh, I go up to D.C. and I meet him there. We go out to dinner, and uh, I, I kind of get a briefing on it. And he said, now you're going to get on an airplane tomorrow out of uh, Washington National. And if you recognize any of the people, you don't know them. 
Okay, all right. So five o'clock in the morning, I'm out there by this white Lockheed Jetstar. Four engines, two on each side. Beautiful Lockheed airplane. Early business jet. Uh, terribly expensive and terribly fuel inefficient. But anyway, I'm, I'm out there. Here comes a staff car. And people get out of it, including a, a stewardess. She's got her flight attendant, I guess. You have to say. she got a, a coffee thermos. And we get on board. And she says, you need to sit in the back. Another mechanic was going down with me. And on comes uh, General Secord, Richard Secord. I knew him from Iran. And he comes on. He gives me a nod of recollection of, you know, of, of acknowledgement. And uh, another guy comes on. And I said to the guy next to me, I says, I wonder what Air Force or Army that lieutenant colonel is in. I should have known it was a Marine by his short sideburns. That was Ollie North. So, and then Dick Gadd, who, whom I knew was on the airplane. So we get down to El Salvador, San Salvador, the city. And uh, our passports are stamped and go to a house. We get a house on the north side of town. Uh, uh, upscale area. And uh, there's a bunch of guys there and we have a bit of a meeting and I go to another house. Anyway, I get, I get in this one uh, three bedroom house. There's five guys there. And, and uh, I start doing my mushroom cartoons right away. We must be mushrooms because, you know, we're kept in the dark and fed on horse shit. And uh, so I have a mushroom of a guy with wings, a pilot and a kicker, a guy with a big boot who kicks the loads out and uh, a radio operator with a headset and so forth. And I start doing these cartoons. Well, we got a C-123 and a Caribou, the Caribou, the C-7A, uh, the Havilland airplane. And um, we go out to the flight line the next day. I go out with a guy named Ernie Cooney, who was a ferry pilot. He'd flown 116 single-engine North Atlantic crossings. I was in awe of that. <laughs> I, later did, I later made five Atlantic crossings, but it was in, in the O2, the Cessna 337. I made five crossings. And the first one was kind of scary after that got boring. Uh, and we meet up on oh, a, uh, a big uh, retired uh, chief warrant officer who was a loadmaster kicker. And we head out to the airport, <clears throat> and we're supposed to meet up with the guy, another guy named John Shutt. I said, where's John? Oh, he's out there. He goes out early every morning. So we get on the caribou, and here's this guy. He's all burned, burned bad. He's up working under the instrument panel and he comes out his hands gnarled up from the from the uh from the burns you know the tendons have been burned through so the, they're gnarled and he comes out wiping his hands greasy hands and he says to ernie he says what do you got here a, a pilot or mechanic and uh he says it's another pilot oh crap someone could break my airplane so I, I said to him i know all about fixing airplanes you put the nut back on the same way as the lid on the peanut butter jar <laughs> he says Pilots never put the lid back on the peanut butter jar. <laughs> <laughs> so that was John Shudd. He was he was a uh, he'd been a tanker in uh, the Korean War. Tanks froze up. He became a fifty cal gunner, and way before the Barrett fifty, he said that fifty was a best shot, best uh, sniper rifle ever. I said, "How far did you wait, shoot, guys? Oh, six, seven, eight hundred yards." I said, what do you do for windage? He said, I'd find the tree nearby. I aim at the tree and see where it hit. And I'd adjust and boom, I'd get him. <laughs> and anyway, he was uh, burned up in a spray accident uh, in Australia. Uh, he's wow. polite as a pilot. So he's a mechanic there. And the caribou had lost an engine uh, coming down from Canada and all loaded up with equipment. And that made up, uh, U.S. News and World Report got a, got a hold of that. So he spent months trying to replace the engine. Um, we do a pre-flight of the of the caribou because we think it'll fly, and it doesn't. So I get in the C-123 with Bill uh, Bill Cooper. Bill had joined the Navy at age 17 or 15 and lied, said he was 17, and that hurt him later on. He had no birth certificate. So the military records were his real birth certificate. So he gets furloughed from airliners uh, early on by two years because he'd faked his age as a teenager. So he's flying cargo, and uh, but he also flew for Air America. And Jim Ryan, chief pilot of Air America, who one wooden leg from an accident, is a friend of and known by General Secord, who did a lot of the special ops in Laos. So when Ollie North decides it'd be a neat idea, as we called it, to sell arms from Israel to Iraq and then replenish with newer arms to Israel and then take the money and buy guns for the Contras, that's a neat idea. Actually, the Iran-Contra is a misnomer. We never used any Iran monies 
in the Contra operation. All the monies came from Ollie North and a guy named Spitz Channel, his fundraiser, getting money from Joe Coors. We got a mall aircraft from Joe Coors and money from rich conservative widows. That's where the money came from. Um, the arms all came out of Portugal. They were all legal, legally shipped uh, you know, from a legitimate arms dealer. It was brokered by a guy named Albert Hakim, who was a expat Iranian, dual citizen in the United States, who had a company in San Jose called uh, Stanford Technologies. Albert Hakim and Richard Secord, the two-star general, and two guys from Laos, two almost renegade CIA guys, uh, Shackley and Kleins, got together after General Secord had arranged the arms shipments to Egypt, F-4s and so forth, when we became the, the uh, arms dealer for Egypt instead of Russia. And they formed Eastco. E-A-S-T-C-O, Egyptian Arms Sale Company Transportation Organization. And each put $250,000 into buying a tramp steamer. That's what got Secord cashiered. He said, I wasn't part of that shipping arms that I brokered. I was just, uh, gave some money to some friends. But anyway, that's what got him out. Well, he is, he gets, he gets a hold of Jim Ryan from Air America. And Jim Ryan hires Bill Cooper. They buy a C-123 from Doan Aviation in Miami. That C-123 had been taken out of the boneyard by the DEA and given to Barry Seal, the fat man. Oh, yeah. Barry Seal was was huge. Not Tom, not Tom Cruise. Not Tom Cruise, This guy was no. big, really big. Well, hey, what do you think about uh, uh, Jack, uh, what's the? Uh, Jack Reacher? Yeah, Jack Reacher, you know, 6'5", 6'5", 260, <laughs> and Tom Cruise. Five, eight. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that airplane was set up after they discovered, well, the uh, SEAL was already involved in a sting. They had a, uh, uh, it was a uh, Convair 240 or 280, uh, the uh, T-39, a T-29 uh, civilian bird. And they had uh, Danny Ortega moving drugs, uh, uh, Ortega's brother, Minister of Defense, moving drugs. So now they're going to get him really good with a C-123. And so SEAL gets a C-123. It's all rigged with electronics. And he's supposed to land on a piece of the interstate under construction in, in Louisiana. Well, he lands in the mud instead of on the concrete. And the L.A. police department, the L.A. Uh, you know, uh, cops arrest him instead of the feds. So that's what put him in the halfway house and the Colombians came and killed him. So Bob Doan ends up with this airplane and sells it. So we go off flying guns to the Contras. And, uh, oh, gosh, mover will take it's – it's a whole other story. It'll take another, another hour easily. But uh, we did make – I made 12 drops to the Contras of 10,000 pounds each, or it was a co-pilot. But uh, we did bring elections back to Nicaragua. And then they reelected Danny Ortega, and it's right back where it started. So you sent me a, a picture, actually, of a C-123 in dire shape. Yeah, it landed uh, in the mud, yeah. Um, was that was down, that you or yeah, who that was, was that? I, I took the pictures. Ollie North uh, labeled that picture, called it one of the or we didn't call the organization, he had a name for it, one of the uh, airplanes landing, an emergency landing in this strip after being suffering com you know combat damage. No, it just landed in the mud. Cooper landed there, hit hard, throttled back, you know, reversed and stuck in the mud. So we had ten thousand pounds of hard rice to unload. We got out the next day, never used the strip again and didn't need to. Um, but uh, that picture it was really something I got called to, to uh, testify in. What? I've lost you or no? No, that's it. I'm just showing the picture. I'm oh, okay. showing the yeah. bottom got left the, corner there. Got called twice to uh, D.C., subpoenaed. And the second time, first time was just congressional staffers. And they didn't know the questions to ask and uh, got out of there. It was just all nonsense. Second time, though, I am at one side of a table with DEA, IRS, uh, FAA, State Department, Department of Defense, probably seven guys uh, around the table interrogating me. And they bring out cotton gloves, put these gloves on, and look at this photo album. Do you recognize this picture? Yes. How do you recognize it? I took the picture. 
You took the picture? Yeah, all these pictures. I had them laid on a coffee table, and Bob Dutton, the boy colonel that worked for Secord, came down. He was our uh, initial contact, you know, in the chain, and he took a lot of the pictures. So that's where they came from. So that was really funny to see this Ollie North uh, photo album. They were all my pictures, but uh, they um, nothing ever happened to me. And uh, only one person, Spitz Channel, the uh, uh, the fundraiser, they got him on perjury, and he died of AIDS. And Ollie North was later, you know, he got off exonerated, and they. Uh, they gave, they threatened me somewhat because I carried ten thousand dollars down one time just for operation procedures, you know, and and they wanted to know if I'd paid tax on it. And I said, "No, where's your receipt for it? You signed for it." And uh, the FBI guy said that uh, got me off of that. They, he really came to my defense that I didn't use the money; it wasn't mine. But that uh, that paid the bills. You know, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, was it dangerous missions you get shot oh, at? or? Oh, oh, gosh, yes. First mission. You ever seen CSU 23-4 at night? I, not in real life, no. Yeah, well, you know what it is. And, of course, they've got yeah, pink yeah. tracers. Pink tracers looking like like uh, 50-foot-long neon tubes coming by you, you know. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty close. We got away from it, though. And, and uh, uh, and of course, they got shot down with an SA-7 later on, taking a shortcut that I advised against. And three guys killed and Hosenfuss bailed out. So that was um, you got, the end of that. You got yeah. shot down? Yeah, the C-123 got shot down on 5th of October of 1986, yeah. And Hassenfuss, the uh, kicker, the loadmaster, was captured. The other guys killed. But it wasn't, you, it wasn't you. It was just somebody with your organization. Yeah, the um, yeah the manager and a co-pilot. Uh, wow. A retired uh, retired Air Force guy, uh, C-123 and caribou pilot. Yeah, and uh, and a uh, a young uh, Nicaraguan. Yeah, they yeah. they were killed. Yeah. 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 So so then you you went. In the same aircraft, but now you're fighting the cartels, right? Yeah, Later that on. was yeah, that was that was good flying over Peru and Colombia. Uh, over Peru, we flew over the Andes. I got 500 crossings to the Andes, and uh, absolutely beautiful, beautiful mountains and uh, landing in airstrips where that were so narrow that the wing tricks, wing tips dragged in the brush on either side. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a great old truck. It could get in and out of 2,000 feet. Uh, just uh, tougher than the C-130. Had a tougher nose wheel. That, that's a big difference. But uh, yeah, it was uh, a lot of fun. Engine engine Martin. failures, icing. Yeah. Were was it were the uh, missions more dangerous uh, doing the cartels or the drug running? Was that the height of? Oh, the drug running was of... worse. Yeah, the drug running because they had the Russians were backing uh, backing Nicaragua with everything from SA sevens all the way up to hundred millimeter guns. So uh, especially the ZSU twenty three four and mobile uh, mobile thirty seven and spotlights. Yeah, so the, that was more dangerous than the drug running. Drug running was seven six two. That's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you talk about in the bio you sent. Uh, you went back at eighty two for a special mission. Can you talk about that? Oh, that was no. That was really simple. They had, we had an airplane that people were afraid of because years before, a guy stalled it and the airplane snapped really hard. So everybody was afraid of it. Well, I flew the airplane years later after a, it was a Cessna 303, counter-rotating props. So in a stall or anything else, it, it was no torque. And I took it up on a test hop and I stalled it and it snapped faster than you could ever roll an airplane. And it did several times in any configuration. Got back down, found there was no tension on the aileron cables. It had been like that for years. And that's what everybody was afraid of. Uh, Wow. And of course, I knew it had been fixed. It had been fixed years before, but they wanted to sell yeah. it. And they were afraid to try to sell it because nobody knew what was wrong with it. So that's so why I got paid for another four months. Wow. Well, before we get into some questions, if you have time, what are you doing now? You've got a museum. You've helped restore an F-105. Uh, what, what, you, what have you been up to? Yeah. I worked out at the Air Museum in Titusville. I haven't done that for a long time now. I should go back out there. So no, we're retired now and trying to travel. And uh, we've had okay. all our cruises canceled, but uh, that's that's basically it right now. Yeah. Yeah. What um, are you still involved with the? I see your shirt. You still involved with the River Rats? Can you tell oh, us yeah. about yeah, that yeah, organization? Yeah. We, yeah, we missed the reunion this time because we uh, plan to go back down to Peru. But yeah, still still involved with them. Yes. What is what is the River Rats? What are they? What is the organization about? They were started up in uh, nineteen. 
66, I believe, uh, late 66, uh, Robin Olds and, um, uh, and others decided that we, we need to get together to find out why are you guys going this altitude and you at that one and, you know, try to get together for a real tactics conference. Everybody's flying over the north of the Red River, Route Pack 6. So uh, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. And um, first ones were scheduled, I think, at Ubon, where Olds was. And then we had several other uh, gatherings through, uh, through Thailand. In 69, um, I got a number of people to show up at the house of, uh, oh gosh sakes, uh, who, can't even think of the guy's name, our deputy for ops anyway, or vice wing commander uh, in uh, Wichita. I didn't make it up there because I had problems with my T-37. But anyway, there they got together the first gathering of the River Rats and had our first gathering uh, practice reunion in Wichita. And then we had Wichita and San Diego, San Antonio, several, several more, all the way up to 73 practice reunions when then all of the POWs came back. And we met in Las Vegas in 73, 3,000 people attending. Every act on the strip was there uh, singing, uh, you know, basically every musical act um, and um, welcoming back all of our friends. And then we've continued on since then with millions of dollars in scholarship funds and and uh, trying to keep alive the uh, telling families, especially to, you know the young children, we care for what your father did, and, and uh, through the scholarship fund, so it's still still pretty active. At first, it was only those who'd flown north of the Red River and North Vietnam in combat. Then we opened it up to combat in Southeast Asia, and now it's basically it would have if he could have or she could have. So there's you know there's a lot more to being a fighter pilot than your your AFSC yeah. or your you know your MOS or whatever. It's really an attitude. So the Red River Absolutely. Valley Fighter Pilots Association comprises a lot more than just guys that, you know, flew with stick and throttle. Yeah. And the one thing that impresses me is every time there's a mishap when somebody passes away, you always see them stepping up, you know, yeah. with, with scholarships and funds and stuff yeah. like that. Do a good awesome. job. Awesome. Do you have time for some questions from the uh, from the kids at home? Okay. Uh, well, it's, uh, give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oscar. Uh, what was more fulfilling or exciting for you, Pio, flying fighters or flying covert transport operations? Oh, gee. Um, probably, I have to look at the, the bigger picture. Flying fighters, if I could stop a railroad car full of 7.62 and 60 millimeter mortar shells to keep from killing guys down south, that would probably be the most rewarding. That would have to be. Yeah. That'd be more than bombing yeah. a bridge. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Ken asked, did you enjoy your time as a personal equipment specialist? Did you support the PJs? Oh, yeah. Gosh, yes. And, uh, yeah, we did support them. I would go out and lay out targets for the PJs and, uh, <clears throat> and record their, their touchdowns and so forth. And it's really funny to talk to guys a thousand feet above and you can talk to them in normal voice because there's no, no attenuation of your voices as the guy's coming yeah. down. Yeah. I liked working with the PJs a lot and, and knew some pretty well, uh, yeah, they were they were pretty fun to work with. One guy one day, uh, Wisniewski, I don't remember his name, Wiz Wisniewski, puts me in a tree suit. And the tree suit has got, I didn't know it, it's a big heavy canvas suit, and I got a, a helmet with a mask. And I didn't know it, but there is a, in the crotch, there's a big two-inch steel U-shaped thing there to keep your crotch from being hit. I didn't know that. He puts me in the in the tree suit with a bunch of people to watch and kicks me right in the crotch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that yeah, was risky awesome. with something else. Yeah, I really like these guys. One of the PJs, uh, Bob uh, George Hill, was about five five and one hundred thirty pounds. A, a B fifty turned, did a misapproach in the wrong direction in a snowstorm out of Yakota, and went into the mountains and crashed. They flew over it in a, in a SA-16, HU-16 seaplane. Captain Arnold was the uh, aircraft commander. And he calls back to Bob Hill, flight engineer, and says, tell George, George Hill, don't bother going out. There's flames down below. It's too rough out there. and They're probably all dead. He said, oh, I'm sorry, Captain. He went out when he first passed over the wreckage. George Hill went out in a winter snowstorm, went into a burning, crashed B-50, and pulled two survivors out. That wow. was in November 1956. The next month, he did the same thing again. You know, Holy just crap. those guys all. 
They're where awesome. do we find such men? Yeah. Where do we? Yeah. God, that's yeah, awesome. Where do you find these guys? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oscar has another question. What would you say to aspiring young pilots who want to change our armed forces and country for the better? Thank you for your service. That's a really good question. Boy, stand up for those immediately above you who are going to bat for you and let them know you care. It takes a lot of guts to be a 17-year Marine Lieutenant Colonel to stand up to what happened in Afghanistan. Stand up for those above and below you and try to try to draw together your strength of knowing what is right. And respectfully, I think the Lieutenant Colonel, he went a little beyond going on Facebook and so forth, but respectfully do everything you can to to call people to task and account and, you know, and do it respectfully. You know, Colonel, I know you're trying to do the right thing, but listen, this is what's happening to me, what you're doing down here. You know, I don't know. It's really tough. I, I, I wish yeah. I could give my daughter the answers. You know, she's, she's suffering the same thing with lack of good leadership. It's yeah. just, uh, just do the best you can. Try to inspire those below you. And, and it's a tough thing for a junior to give counsel to somebody older, but do the best yeah. you can with it. And when you can't, then um, like uh, Hubbard said in his statement of loyalty, which I remember from OCS, it was, oh gosh, I, I can only remember, if speak well of your institution and stand by what it represents. If you must condemn and eternally find fault and resign your position, but as long as you're part of it, try to support it, you know, and uh, yeah. um, do the best you can just to try to make a difference. It's, it's tough. It's, it's, it's almost a losing battle, but try, just yeah. try. Yeah. Uh, Harrison asks, uh, do you take anything or do anything before a mission for good luck? You get any good luck charms? <laughs> that's really funny. Uh, that's a good one. I'm on an air, on a, a, a step van, you know, the truck, the uh, bread truck going out to the fly one day. And I got a little, uh, water bottle, a little flash type water bottle. And I dump it out because I'm going to fill it with fresh cold water. And Owen Hawkins, Owen the Hawk says, don't do that. Don't do that. Since you're six alpha water, six alpha was the area above the Red River. And I said, yeah. well, I do it every day. Oh, if you do it every day, you do it every day. You know, you wear the same, <laughs> you wear the same underwear on every mission oh. up to Six Alpha. Oh. He said, it got so tattered, he had to wear it over other underwear. But uh, <laughs> when I got in the airplane, now, you know, okay, you're a fighter pilot, right? When you yep. first got in an airplane, you had, or in a car, you had your seat way forward in the car, right? When mm -hmm. you first started to drive, then you moved it back oh, yeah. and moved it back. Rudder pedals. I had them on number six slot, which is way back where you know, yeah. had the little dogs you could push, number six slot. And I kept them there until I came off the target and I pushed them back out to number nine, which is a heck of a lot more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was my only, that was all I had. Yeah. Yeah, it's now, awesome. On, on, on the water, I got one in the water. We had a one quart water bottle. Crew chief would fill it with crushed ice and water, and it was back here over the shoulder. And there was a tube hooked to it with a valve. And you can shove this tube under your oxygen mask and push the valve and suck the water in. And I would not drink the water until it's coming off the target. I just didn't you know, that, 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 whatever works, you yeah, know, whatever, works. whatever, whatever <clears throat> you're, it obviously worked. It well, obviously worked. Yeah. So I'm coming home one day, we're refilling over the Gulf of Tonkin and I reach for the little handle, pull it out of its clip and shove it in my mouth and <clears throat> nothing, nothing. What's wrong? Sometimes the, the the plastic hose would freeze in front of the piccolo tube that gave our cold air. So I reached yeah. back to, to trace it back down and it stops at the canopy rail. And I look out at the canopy rail and here's a sloop of plastic tubing outside. I pinched it in the canopy. I uh -oh. was never mover, I've never been so thirsty in my damn life. <laughs> I can't pull it in. The canopy no. I I'm literally thinking I'll pull it up. It was zero degrees, zero degrees stall. I'll crack the canopy, pull it in, and pluck it. I didn't. I didn't. But I came home just couldn't believe uh, how thirsty it was. No, but it was. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You can't. You can't not think about it. Once yeah, you know, right. you yeah, can't once, not think about it. That's right. Uh, the, uh, no. the, we had a we had a pee bottle. I thought now they got a one quart water bottle over here. They got a one pint pee bottle over here. And I look at that pee bottle. That's the oh reason no. I that's the reason I didn't, didn't drink more water on the way in. The pee bottle had a horn on it, you know, with a little valve that you could, you know, you could open it, and you had to 
unzip your flight suit. You know, get your legs spread apart. You're way back on the seat pad, you know, and you got parachute straps down to your crotch and you're going to have to whatever, take your, you know, your mm -hmm. organ out and point it. You know? <laughs> I said, no, that's why I didn't drink water until I was on my way home. Uh, I, I have no sympathy for you, sir, because I peed in an F-16. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen a cockpit of an F-16, but you're peeing uphill. Oh, you're sitting, oh, right. you're laying down trying to pee uphill. <laughs> so, yeah, you got a hook oh. shot or you got a yeah. stand. Yeah. It's, it's not, I, I can't, that's one of those places where I'm just like, you know, I had it worse, <laughs> just so you know. Well, uh, I, used to, I used to drive from Fort Walton Beach down to Titusville where I did all the surveillance flying. It's seven hours. I drink a thermos of coffee on the way down and never pee. I'd fly 10 hour miss, 10 hours from uh, St. John's, Newfoundland down to the Azores ferrying airplanes and never pee. And then one day I got a kidney stone. So keep oh, on drinking water yeah, and keep yeah, on you peeing. Yeah, definitely pee. Yeah. Uh, speaking of down under, Jeff would like to know if you flew with Australians in Vietnam. No, no, I oh I but no, but I went to the I went to the O Club to the Australian O Club in Phan Rang when I was over there dropping the three thousand pound bombs in South Vietnam. And I, mm -hmm. I meet up with a buddy from OCS, uh, who's also one of my instructors in the uh, F-111. He's flying Huns, F one hundreds out of Phan Rang then. He says, We're going to the Aussie Club tonight. Great. He says, You gotta change clothes. I'm in a goat skin, you know, no mix flying suit. No, you gotta change clothes. I said, what? Yeah. Okay, all right. What do I have to wear? Well, here, and he gives me a pair of slacks and a dress shirt and a tie. What? What? Yeah, to go to the Aussie club. And I know these guys are wild men, and they were, but they were wild gentlemen. You know, you had to. You know. So that's wow. the only time. I, that's my only interaction with them. Been to Australia a couple of times and, and loved the country. I'm sorry for the shape it's in now, but yeah. But that was my only interaction with them. They were flying Canberras over there. Wow. Well, um, what was, are you still flying today? Do you do any kind of aviation, no, no, no flying stuff? No, what no, was your done. favorite aircraft to fly in your entire career? You know, it's a toss up actually between the C-123 and the F-105. You know, really? There couldn't be any more options, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, if I mean, if you had to pick an aircraft that you've never flown, I mean, was there ever one you were like, man, I wish I'd have gotten a chance to fly it? It was on my dream sheet when I came back from Southeast Asia at the A-1, yeah. Yeah, the A1 Sky wow. Raider with a 3350, yeah. that great big round engine. I love a round engine. I really like them. It's a takes a, it's a, it's an art just to start it, but I love them. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you, you didn't do any uh, like airline flying or anything like that after no, you never got no. never. I, I, don't I never had an interest yeah. in it. Actually, not an interest at all. And you know, I've yeah. never had never had. I guess you call it a non-revenue flight. I I have never had a pleasure flight. But everyone was an absolute joy, absolute wow. joy. You know, wow. uh, I got a ride. Uh, we went down to Cancun a while back, uh, a couple weeks ago, and a guy in JetBlue made a landing that was the softest, most beautiful landing I've ever heard, been in, in an airliner. I went up as yeah. the cockpit went up past the cockpit. I said, "Guy, that was the most beautiful touchdown ever." His eyes were still like this. I can't believe it. I still can't believe it. And I had one in a thud where I never felt it. I tell you, I never felt it touch the ground. Never awesome. nine nine thousand hours and probably nine thousand landings. Had a lot of times and I flew many many landings. Uh, never felt wow. it touch the ground and uh, that was beautiful. But no, I've never uh, never never cared to fly sir, uh, you know, and I've never flown a pleasure flight. Wow, or revenue. I guess you could say. But you're you're obviously you're you you've passed on that love of aviation to your your children, which is awesome. My daughter surprised me. I came back from Iraq um, in November of. Um, just before I turned, uh, no, it was in Ju June, it was my first tour in Iraq. I meet Dana, my wife, and, and Elizabeth in the Orlando airport. And she's got a gift bag for me for Father's Day. And I opened up and there was a book in there, 100 Amazing Flying Stories. And she had the 100 marked out. Now I've been flying, I've been, you know, 26 to 28 hours making my way all the way back from, from Iraq. And she had the 100 cross out 101. I didn't understand that, but 101 fly stories, but. Oh, Liz, you know, I'd love to read. Great, thank you. So there's something else in the in the bag, Dad. I pulled it out. It was a pilot's logbook. I said, wow, Liz, how'd you know? Mine, I need a new one. Mine's almost full. She says, well, Dad, you can't use the first page. She already had seven flights. Didn't even know it. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, really proud of her. 
and she's so good. that must have been you must have been there recently then right i mean w w what year were you in iraq oh, no I, I left 2010 when obama would not do uh, upgrade the status of forces yeah what were you doing there i was flying surveillance surveillance and mapping uh, lidar mapping and uh wow. and surveillance yeah we had eight bases there and uh, we were probably the in tw oh, 25 regular airplanes flying surveillance and a few extras doing other stuff yeah no kidding yeah, yeah. we were wow. there for 10 years yeah and she got hired guard she went to the guard she's with the reserve here with the air force uh, reserve air rescue with the 920th that's awesome. wing yeah that's yeah. awesome that's smart I always tell people that's one of the things of the channel. I tell the guard reserve the best kept secret oh, in the yeah. military. Yeah. Yeah. And they just got brand new J models. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, have you been able to ride? Have you have you been able to fly with No, her? but I'm gonna I'm gonna press her on that. I'm gonna press her because that would really be something to be on the airplane with her. Yeah. Yeah. It awesome. Would. Well, well, Pio, it's been an absolute privilege, sir. Just a privilege oh. and an honor. This has been amazing. I mean, well, thank, thank just, you very much, Mover, because, you know, the stories, I mean, I don't do this out of ego, but the stories have to be told. And, and, absolutely. Uh, just like I want to hear, I mean, I'm in contact with a couple of uh, World War II P-51 pilots, you know, and their stories need to be told and learned. And Wow, we got to get them on the channel. Well, Jesus. Well, one of them is, is now uh, just missed a reunion, and the other one's going blind, but maybe we can get them on there. I'll, I'll try to put them in touch with you. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll yeah. figure it out. That is that is awesome. Well, I, I, yeah, just the stories you've told. I mean, just your career has been amazing. I mean, it's 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 the kind of stuff that I think people need to hear because it also inspires the next generation. And if we yeah. can, you know, learn learn the good lessons and you know learn from everything, I think it makes us all better and, and makes the the profession better. It will. It'll do that. Well, the the next time we get together, let me interview you. Anytime. We'll have yeah. to do it in the bar. We'll have to do it. We'll, we'll make a next time I'm over uh, on that side of Florida, we'll have to make a trip out there. That'll All right. be a good well, time. Yeah, here you can see the there's the two taps there. Yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. All right. And uh, are, yeah, we'll are, do that. now are, winter. Have you written any books? Uh, I, I wrote the Contra experience, but it never sold. Uh, I've got uh, I have published uh, 62 short stories. And uh, got some other other. I, I do a lot of writing, but uh, I just there's so much going on every day, and you know, got a marriage yeah. I got to take care of. And, well, and uh, you is know. it well? If if there's a link, you send me the link. We'll we'll push it. We'll put it in the description so people can find it. If there's a way for people to to find your work, because I'm sure after sitting here for two hours, I guarantee you people want to read more. There are okay. people I want to know more, so I know <laughs> other people want to know more too. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been this has really tested my wife's patience with me because she's uh, heard all the stories for 46 years. But uh, yeah, yeah, we'll stay in touch. Well, it's been an absolute honor, sir. I appreciate it. I always give the last word to my guest. Anything you want to add? Any words of wisdom, parting shots for anybody? No, just uh, I guess uh, for the young people, keep on keeping on. And keep in mind, this is not a democracy. It's a republic. And the word is not freedom. It is liberty. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Pio, we appreciate it, sir. Thanks so much. And thanks, everybody, for holding on, watching. It's been amazing. The two hours has flown by. <laughs> Hope everybody has a great week and have a good night. Thank you very much. Cheers. We'll see you.